your spread this spreadsheet <clears throat> that we got from upstairs yesterday, uh, whatever day it was last week. There is almost a billion dollars from the Equipment Revolving Loan Fund to start an IT revolving fund. <clears throat> They're saying that money is in BGS. And I want to find out, is it in BGS? Because BGS is saying they don't have this fund. <coughs> so I don't Eric is going to look at this. And if it's 945000 being taken out of it, what's left in that fund? Mary, do you have it's, insight into it's this? mislabeling. It is not in BGS. It was moved in 2015. Yes, Eric's so good, he's got you the information already. Is it that the one we did with the treasurer? No. no. You moved it over into the Secretary of Administration's office. It's managed by finance and management. And it's in the Secretary's office. There is some money in the revolving loan fund for equipment. They're proposing to add an additional 945000 for information technology projects that departments had been entering into lease contracts for, which they should not be doing. So this is not, I want to buy a computer screen or whatever, you know, stuff, but it's slightly larger things that they would um, be entering into lease contracts, and as you know, you don't want people to be doing that. Um, so this is a way to help pay over a short period of time. But you may want to look at what the details of that are to make sure you're satisfied. Well, I guess it's real confusion because it says transfer to the BGS, the BGS yeah. equipment revolving fund, <coughs> to capitalize an IT revolving fund. So where are you transferring from? Uh, from from the extra money that we had on the bottom line. So it's not coming from, from another a fund, fund to another fund. Well, it's coming from the general fund. So there was excess cash. We heard. So the equipment boxes. revolving loan fund would have a, a carve out for IT. Yeah. And capitalized, they're proposing that 945000 and I think we've already take, taken testimony that that's probably about 200000 <clears throat> That number may need to change, too, the amount that goes into there, just because there may not be that much on the bottom line. They have extra money. There's money on the bottom line. There is this need. The question is, do you agree with the notion of having a, a capital IT fund, not not a capital, an IT revolving fund. So you're looking more right now to see if we would agree to carve out an IT revolving yeah. within fund. the equipment revolving mm -hmm. fund. If you look at bulletin 17 point, uh, 7 point 14, which you can probably find on our website because we asked to see it, you'll see the details of how it's administered. So what will the amount be? They're asking for 975. We have not made a decision. We just know that as we were going through some of the other funds that it looked like there was a need somewhere else to spend some money. So that may be reduced. But we need to, uh, and so uh, I, the question is uh, to you all also is what should the amount be? I, I don't we know don't how know. you know that. We have no it, clue. Uh, uh, no one knows that. Yeah. You do that in markup. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, some of this is just balancing the bottom line. Okay. So the other question that we maybe that we can answer is, is this a good idea? Right. Is this a good, good idea? idea? Yeah, so, yeah. And I particularly I remember that, you know, back when I hung out with you guys, there were some questions about the equipment revolving loan fund right. and how it was administered. So right. look at bulletin seven point point four. We written in two thousand fifteen to We'll do that we'll in our free these. time. Yeah, you should. Yeah. We'll do that in our time. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. <coughs> so it's not BGS. It's not BGS. Okay. 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 So let's shift to DOC. We're going to have a room full and a 
afternoon full of DOC. We're going to start first off with this spreadsheet um, to really hear about the, sh the increased um, recommend on Hep C and MAT treatment. Would that be with you, Commissioner, or is that going to be more? Well, uh, or do you want to start off and then transition? You want me to do that for the folks that don't know me and we can start there and then jump into it? For the them. MAT and the Hep C. I don't want to get into Chittenden yet. Okay. I want to. So why don't, why, don't, why don't I have Max and Andy come on and talk about Okay. And I'll, 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 I'll fill you in when I come back. Okay. About, you know, they're going to talk to you about the numbers. And I'll talk to you about, uh, about behind that, the agency piece on it. Fair enough. That would be great. Okay, mm -hmm. Chair, Give us Chair Emmons, before our commissioner steps down, we are very have limited knowledge about what's in the BAA, and we're here more as subject matter experts. So who and so have the... So I, can I, know talk to the I can talk to the dollar figures. They can talk to the program. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about the dollar figures, okay. and there will be questions about the program. Okay, because there is 1.6 million that's being requested for an increase to Hep C and MAT treatment costs, and then there's also an increase in the out-of-state beds from about 1.3 million. So that's what we're looking at, and um, that's the first thing we're going to do with corrections and get that out of the way, and then we're going to come back. And we really talk about what's um, Department of Corrections update and a real conversation with the new commissioner um, and continue our discussions from what uh, we talked about last week with Priya and the whole picture. So we have a new commissioner, an interim commissioner, Commissioner Jim Baker. <coughs> and Commissioner Baker spent a lot of time in this committee back in <laughs> 10 years ago, 12 years ago. It was 10 and a half years ago I retired from the state police. Wow. <laughs> so whenever we had any um, <coughs> state police issues, like building new barracks or any issues, Commissioner Baker would come in and testify before us. So, and then in the interim, you've done a lot. Maybe just update the committee a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so I'll do a little bit of that, get the numbers out, let Annie and Max talk to the program a piece of those questions yeah. around that. And then we can come back to uh, what my approach is <coughs> to corrections. Yeah, great. So as, as the uh, chair has said, my name is Jim Baker. Uh, my background, uh, I was with the state police for about 31 years. And uh, I retired in 2009 as the director of Colonel. Some folks said that that is the highest ranking member of the state police. Um, I took a little bit of time off and uh, doing some consulting work, and then uh, I stepped into the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, the executive director's position in an interim role, and uh, a little bit of history there. I know that uh, Representative Shaw and Emmons remember this well um, because of their their work at the academy, but. Uh, it was a suicide of a staff member and uh, some issues that were going on at the academy. Doug governor Douglas was the governor at the time and I had just left the state police and uh, I was asked to come back in an interim role at the police academy. I was there for about a year and a half and uh, uh, got some classes through the academy and uh, left a report behind with some recommendations that I think um, the current director, Rick Gothier, has been following over the years. Um, I then went back to doing a little consulting, then my phone rang again in December of 10, and uh, this time it was the Rutland City Police Department. And uh, I, uh, I went in there as an interim role, uh, thinking I was staying for six months. And uh, quite honestly, I fell in love with the city, and I fell in love with the people there, and I fell in love with what the city was about, and I stayed three years. And uh, uh, that, that was a... Uh, that was a challenging time in my career. Um, I know Representative Shaw, you were there for part of it. Um, and out of that came Project Vision, uh, which uh, still stands. And, uh, uh, and this kind of ties into the, the, the MAP program. Uh, you know, we set up a methadone clinic in the city. And uh, I got a lot of credit for dra dragging down the crime rate. Burglaries dropped about 80%. But um, it does not take a mathematician to figure out if you put 400 people into treatment, uh, 
um, 250, 300 of them are doing well, and each of them were committing about $70,000 a year in crime, yeah. your crime rate's going to go down. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I left there. I went to Washington for about three years. I worked on the executive staff at the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, where I had oversight over a couple significant um, programming to include the DRE program nationally. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, the Center for Officer Safety and Wellness and the Center for Community Policing. And uh, uh, I, I left there to do some consulting, and I've been doing some consulting, and then uh, two weekends ago, my phone rang again. <coughs> and uh, here I am as the interim commissioner for 120 days. The so, gift, uh, the gift that you can't keep a job. <laughs> she says you can't keep a job. It is true, I can't keep a job, and if I went through this and you did the math, I was colonel for three years, chief for three years, and an ICP for three years. Well, you got There's three years ahead of you now. Not, not, and all due respect, though, but that's what it means. That's, uh, if my wife was here, she'd tell you it's not. Well, we say from Southern Vermont, it's the gift that keeps giving. Thank you. Thank you. So, so let me just touch on, I, I, I'll, I'll touch on um, the hepatitis C funding first. And, and again, I'm... This is my sixth day. I did get briefed up on these budget numbers, and I'm going to give you the best I possibly can of why uh, corrections came back in for a budget adjustment. Um, on, on the hepatitis C, it's a simple uh, issue of we originally started out with one or two patients, and now we're at 25 patients. And um, the original price of treating a patient was about $60,000 per person. That has significantly dropped to about 15, but the number significantly went up. And as I understand it, the, uh, that was one-time funding. I'm not sure the source of it in 20s budget, but uh, that's the reason for that number to go up. On the MAT cost, um, uh, that was again one-time money. We're now at about 700 people that we're treating in the population. Uh, for, for opiates. Um, so, as I understand it, um, no one anticipated that number to go to 700. And um, I'll, I'll let the folks talk about the medical piece of it, and I'll be more than happy to talk about what I've been asking for questions inside the agency <coughs> on this. Um, we do have some challenges there. And then the 309,000 and change um, for health care services, that simply represents the cost, additional cost of the contract with our vendor because of the increase in the number of patients both for that and hepatitis C. It takes more time of the medical staff to deal with that. Well, let me jump over. Uh, if, if, you, if you want me, uh, Ms. Chair. Can I ask a question? Let's see. Before you, you're you, jumping before over I, to out of state beds. I was going to jump over to out of state beds if folks have questions on. The medical piece. Let's ask there. the medical piece okay. first. Questions? So of the 1.6 million, 1.6 <clears throat> includes, you now have 20 patients at 15,000 per person. 25 patients at 15,000. 25. And then MAT, you've got 700. That's How much is that per person, do you think, MAT? It's going to vary depending on what they're receiving, but is there a ballpark figure? <coughs> there are too many variables and I don't have that number on the top of my head. You know, bup and methadone have different prices, people are on all different doses. Obviously hubs are more expensive yeah. in some regard because of the transport and the security impact. Um, also depends on whether we're continuing them or whether we're initiating, yeah. whether we're taking them in for reassessment. There are separate costs for assessment, reassessment, and then obviously continued dosing and monitoring. So it, it really is all over the map. Some people could be on BUP and then transfer to methadone and they could get adjust. So I'm trying to break down the 1.6. You said that 309000 is additional cost to the vendor. So where's the other 1.3 million between Hep C and MAT? That would be the increase for more patients being on there. It says also increase in healthcare staffing. Mm -hmm. Would there be an increase in staffing here? Is that the 309,000 for the yeah, vendor? Yeah, as, as it was explained to me by Matt, 
that was that's the increase of the 309 it's staff. 98 staff okay. you know it's it's a, it's a big process to put people through uh, the line for for the map program I mean it's a high security issue you know and we, we are dealing with some diversion as a result of that questions I can see Kurt, and I can see Carl. Um, <laughs> Carl first, because he's got his question. Just made. doing the, just doing the. Good afternoon, Commissioner. How are you? Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Um, just doing the quick math here. It looks like the Hep C funding is about three hundred seventy-five thousand. Does that mm -hmm. sound about right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that leaves about nine hundred thousand plus on MAT. Is that? It leaves about a million. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're losing me. So, so our budget adjustment, we're asking for 880. It's 1.6 million. So we got 1.6 on our spreadsheet. We got 1.6 million on our spreadsheet, which would be an increase in Hep C and MAT treatment costs, <coughs> including increased health care staffing under the contract. Right. There's also an increase in pilot funds pursuant to Act 72. For six thousand. That's six thousand. Right. So, so I didn't add these up. I'm assuming the Excel spreadsheet I have in front of me calculated that correctly at one point six two five change. <coughs> one point six two five, yep. So we're just trying to never do math in public, but that's what we're doing. Right. Yeah, so it's one point six two five. Yeah, it's almost a million. A million. <coughs> Is that for the MAT? A million. Or 900,000? Yeah, this is Max. Max may be able to bail me out. Yeah. I wasn't involved in that particular calculation, but I can say as far as Hep C treatment goes now, we are. Um, initiating treatment for about a half dozen people per month that's an average over the past six months mm -hmm. that's after the initial treatment of a, a larger population of people who are already in our custody that's like an, an expected to be ongoing situation um, that can range anywhere from 75 eighty thousand a month to 120 130 a month depending on what course of treatment those those mm -hmm. six people again an average would need um, which varies by their clinical presentation. So I would say that a larger percentage of that money that you're looking at is going towards Hep C um, than MAT at this point. If you do the calculation for what we've had for the past six months. So, so, so that tells yeah, is it not broken out in this? No, we oh, just have well, 1.625, but 6,000 of that is for increase in pilot costs. Right. So, right. so just multiplying. 25 patients by 15,000 doesn't that's yeah, I'm that's not, not getting us to the right yeah place. I'm not sure that the tw I'm not sure what the 25 patients number is like we get the monthly cost data and um, clinical data from our contractor and what I'm seeing is anywhere from like four to eight a month are being initiated on that treatment we pay the full course up front to ensure that that patient gets the full course of treatment and so if you look at that moving forward that's been consistent for five or six months now um, it's really a larger number of patients for the next year the next year being the end of this fiscal year. Right. So if you look at, let's say, there's an average of six per month for yep. six months. Yep. That's going to be more than what yep. 25. That's, that gets us more into the 600,000 range or right. 500. Yeah, okay, got it. And I apologize. I thought no, that's the spreadsheet that it was broke out because that's what I'm looking at. I apologize. No, that's fine. And those numbers, um, the numbers, that's just the cost of the medication itself. Doesn't include uh, staff time for workup, outpatient treatment, you know, consulting with the UVM specialist. So and that number's not, that's not captured in the 309 for the contractor. So I, oh, yeah, I, would, I don't know about, I think it's probably all inclusive in the number that was presented, but what I just said, the like 75 <coughs> to 120 a month, that's just the medication. Okay, yeah, got right, it, all right, right, thank you. Thanks, Max. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Any? Kurt? Maybe you could clarify. Um, the program started, and didn't we do a 
budget uh, adjustment with one-time money before? Haven't we done a $2 million one? one? At, at C or MAT? MAT. When we first started it, it was really one-time money, and they were hoping for savings. Was it the Medicaid budget that would be offset? That's when we first started. The pilot. <clears throat> I was like two or three years ago. Because they were hoping yeah. there'd be savings in another part of their budget, particularly for mm -hmm. services on the outside for folks with MAT. And I think it was looking more at the Medicaid. And then they could shift some of those savings for the yeah. initiation of MAT. And they don't think it materialized. I don't know. But, that but if we look at the, the program in general, I mean, it started out to be estimated at the beginning of like 400,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, a one-time <coughs> money of a couple million, I thought, at one point. That would have been a year or so, yeah. two years ago. And when I testified, Annie Ramis and the Department of Rogers, <coughs> when we originally were developing the bill beyond the initial stages of the pilots, we were basing our estimates mm -hmm. on the Rhode Island model and guesstimating they were coming in at like 1.4 million, I think. And so that, that was the number we kind of put around. And it was part tobacco money, and then I can't remember. Was something. There was some a tobacco savings settlement. somewhere that we And then we something else. Shift. Now we've shifted. We, we, got a, we got some money from the health department, some SOAR money from the health department. Um, and we used that to make up. Um, I can also speak to the staffing issue, possibly. But again, we weren't part of Matt's discussion. And, prepping with the, with the commissioner. What, what I'm trying to figure out is what's, these are, there's a lot of one-time money in here. What's the on, ongoing hit going to be? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, mean, I think the ongoing is going to be base budget. And how much is that amount going to be for right. MAT for 700 in there? But does the base budget include the one-time money? No. 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 So, no. so we're going to, there's going to, no. I mean, we're moving, you now move into that one-time money started the program, okay? So that one-time money is now gone, but the program is still existent, so it becomes a cost to your base budget of DOC. Right. That's what happens. So, because we're hiring staff and things like that, which is going to have to mm -hmm. continue. But also the medication, you're purchasing yeah. more medication. Yeah. So how much for 700 inmates is the MAT program in the DOC? How much I, is that? My best recollection of re in reviewing this with Matt was that it was like 1.6 annually. <coughs> so we're not off base from the 1.4? No. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's close. And the staffing issue is, again, meeting the community standard We've uh, worked closely, obviously, with the health department in ensuring that we're achieving that. And we increased the staff, and not just on the security side, to address what the commissioner talked about in terms of you know, managing security in the map line, helping to prevent diversion, but also in regard to the actual medical providers. Um, we've replicated this, the health department state plan of community-based spokes which basically creates a metric of one MAT clinical case manager and one MAT RN per 100 patients. So also adding a layer to this, we are also looking at going out to bid for a new vendor because our contract with the current vendor expires this summer, when? February? June 30th. June 30th. Centurion. So DOC is now in the process of going out <coughs> to bid for a vendor. Could be Centurion, could be somebody else at the end. We don't know yet. Their contract is expiring. Centurion's contract is expiring. Because we've been with them for what, five years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But on these, these costs, the 1.6 million we're talking about is above and beyond the vendor cost. That's correct. Anything else on the budget adjustment piece for MAT and Hep C? Okay, out of state bids. We've had an increase in costs. When we do when the budget is done, they really look at projecting our out of state bed needs and then 
budget accordingly. And every budget adjustment, there's always an adjustment to the out-of-state appropriations. Sometimes the out-of-state beds have decreased in use, and sometimes they've increased <coughs> in use. So. So I'm, again, uh, Mr. I'm going to try to do the best I can in six days of news. Um, <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. As, as I was briefed, we budgeted in fiscal year 20 for 220 average of 225 beds. And we've been averaging this fiscal year about 273. And as I sit here today, the report that I get daily, um, we're at 268 uh, in the facility in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, um, that that's, that's the request for the budget adjustment <coughs> for, for the 1.3 million. The difference, because we've been averaging about 273 versus the 225 that was budgeted. Uh, Commissioner, you know, this may be a question you can't answer, but do you know if we have anybody out of state now as a result of construction going on with either at Springfield or Newport or someplace like that? I, I, I was told the answer to that is no. No, okay. Um, but I, I can double check no, that. that okay. Carl. I guess I would just, I'd add to that question and other facility work, like what, what was going on in St. John's Bay this summer? That, that. There was some, there was some this summer. Well, there were some out. from mm -hmm. St. Jay or shifted to Newport, right. and the folks in Newport had to be moved out of state, and then there was also construction. You know, I think I remember hearing that they didn't have to move anybody out of state. They were able to shift people around enough right. to keep those people in state. I think we heard that this morning. How much do we pay for <coughs> bed out of state per year? Is it twenty thousand? Thirty? We have to thirty? Twenty-eight? Anybody know? We're putting you uh, on the spot. Yeah, but I'm gonna say this and I'll, I'll double check it, but I think it's either seventy or seventy-five a day. Um, mm -hmm. so right. I, I will double check that. It's a net law part. Um, I probably should ask that question before I left, but <clears throat> I believe it's, it's between 70 and 75 a day. Okay. <laughs> much we can do about that nope. until we figure out what we're doing in state. Carl. Kirk. 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 It's early okay. still. Yeah, it's Tuesday. <laughs> it's only my the two third the second Tuesday. It's only one for you. Um, the contract does it does it have a minimum number of of uh, it does. But are we setting a new minimum with this edition? Uh -huh. No. Okay. Uh -huh. What is and the minimum is two and a quarter. Two hundred is it one fifty? Two hundred? It was over two hundred. <laughs> Jumps into my head. You want my last year's notes, Kurt? No, no, no. That's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure this was this wasn't changing the minimum. Oh yeah. No. No, you'd have to negotiate that. Contract. Yeah. But you do have a maximum too. Right. Yeah, the minimum max. Yeah. I, I think it's either two or two twenty-five. Again, please don't hold me to that. So it's a cost of doing business. <clears throat> Any questions? So we'll have further committee discussion in terms of what I recommend will be upstairs to the folks because they're going to be doing markup and they will look to us for some direction. In this. Anything else from Annie? Or nothing? Well, that was easy. Then we can go back to work. <laughs> we'll have you in for a longer, longer term. A chat. A great chat as we sit in here. So, Let's transition to the more, um, the bigger issue, the you know, one that gets more public attention. It's the ongoing situation within uh, corrections, within the Chittenden facility, but also system-wide within DOC. And this is an opportunity for the commissioner to share with us, uh, to welcome him on board, if you want. Our condolences, and also you've been on. You said you've been on 
the job for about a week. And um, I. Seventh, seventh day. Seventh day. <laughs> oh, you can rest. <laughs> you can rest the seventh day. Well, listen, I'm just trying to figure out how long I can write this. Right <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> so, we'd like you just to give us an update in terms of what you've been seeing or what you've been thinking. Um, so, let me. Um, path forward. Let me start with just a couple of general comments here. I know corrections is a big interest of this committee, obviously. And uh, I think it's important that we know, I mean, some of you folks know me fairly well. Other folks don't know me at all. Um, you know, for, first of all, you heard, you heard what I've done for work. And when I went into the academy in Raleigh well, City Police Department, I never met with the fire leaders over there. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, and I won't get into it because I don't want to be doing, um, you know, talking to someone's character. But I went into a very bad leadership situation in both of those situations. And I went in and tried to figure it out on my own with the assistance of other folks. In this case, um, I had never met Commissioner Duchette before. We had never met before. And uh, the week before I started, I had a meeting with Secretary Smith. Um, to talk about the process moving forward. And um, that same day, I met with the commissioner for two hours. And um, Mike Touchette's a good man. And um, in two hours, I learned a lot from him about um, how to run a correctional system and uh, some of the history. And I, I want to say this publicly that um, I believe that Mike Touchette was heading in the right direction. And he shared that with me. And I think you will find with me that my thoughts around the criminal justice system, even though I come from a law enforcement background, and some of this was shaped in my experience in Rutland, and some of it was shaped in my experience when I was in D.C., um, is not much different than what Mike Touchette looked at the correctional system. Our job is to create good citizens, not good inmates. And we should be doing that with dignity and respect for everyone involved in the system. Um, and um, that, that is something I've been talking about. Um, when I walked into Waterbury a week ago yesterday, and I had my first senior staff meeting with the senior staff in Waterbury, what I found is a, uh, a group of leaders that are totally demoralized. There was a lot of emotion in that room. This is within Central Office. Within Central Office, the senior leadership <clears throat> team. And there were some tears shed. Uh, and what, what the secretaries asked me to do was not come to corrections and make enormous changes in four months. What he's asked me to do is stabilize the staff, provide leadership to the staff, and I'm going to defend the staff when the staff needs to be defended. Um, and, and I think some of the staff in the room will tell you that one of the things I've repeated over and over again is we need to start telling our own story because there's some unbelievable stuff that goes on inside corrections every day, especially when it comes to dignity and humanity. And so um, I recognize that the reports that are coming out of South Carolina are serious allegations. And I think Secretary Smith did the right thing in bringing in an outside group to conduct an investigation into those allegations. And that's that's happening over here. And I, I will be working very close with Chris Kaufman and his team from the law firm investigating those allegations. And I was at the meeting when the secretary told him he has the keys to all the <clears throat> other institutions as well. If he thinks he needs them to take a look at uh, what's going on. At the same time, my job is to run the agency and get people refocused. And I started that um, by getting my arms uh, around um, the staff in, in the central office last week. I was in South Burlington on Friday, uh, meeting with Superintendent Stone. Um, she's doing some incredible work there. And she's doing some incredible programming work um, with, with the women that are housed there. And, um, I also have to say publicly that, um, you know, I, I've got a 40-year relationship with corrections over the years. 
Um, I remember early on as a young trooper um, bringing people to a facility and you didn't know who the inmates and the guards were. Mm -hmm. And I've watched the evolution of that agency over 40 years develop into an agency where there's a lot of folks that work there that I have a deep amount of respect for, that really care about the folks we serve and really understand that we play a role in keeping communities safe. And um, there, there are very good employees inside corrections. And I have to say in front of this committee, as I'll say in other committees, I know some of them personally. I've known them for a long time. Um, I just watched this morning a video of, a, of, a, uh, of an assault of a corrections officer in St. Johnsbury last night. Um, these are very, very dangerous jobs. And the work that they're doing takes an enormous strain on the staff. Um, I'm hearing stories of people being worked, forced to work 16 hours straight, taking six and eight hours off, sleeping in their car, coming back to work in another 18 hours. It's not safe, it's dangerous, it's not the way to run a system. And so my focus over the next four months, I guess it's a little less than that now, my wife actually has an app on her iPad. Counting the days. Counting the days down. Um, my focus is to get my head under the hood and try to leave behind some suggestions on what, what I see in conjunction with what Triscoff and teams come back with to try to move uh, corrections to the next level. But I got, I got to repeat again that um, the staff that's around me in Central uh, are all career folks. This has been their life. And, um, you know, uh, I think we're having a better week this week. And uh, I'm hoping to have a better week next week. And um, we're dealing with issues as they come up, especially issues around investigations and discipline. So I wanted to kind of set that frame. And I'm certainly open to any questions or comments or feedback. Um, I do think that Representative Evans and Representative Morrissey and Representative Shaw that know me well, um, and you know, this is not me pounding on my chest. I am a no-nonsense guy. I come to work every day. I come to work. And I have a very high standard for public, <coughs> public service. And I have a very low tolerance for people who don't serve the public the way they should be served. And I consider the folks that, by statute, I'm now responsible for, you know, in the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. I take that role very seriously. And um, I take the folks that we are, uh, are entrusted with very seriously, with the understanding that there are some very dangerous people in jail. And, um, you know, I, I'm excited about some of the conversations that are going on around justice reinvestment. Uh, you know, I, I'm probably letting the cat on the bag early, but I'm interim, so let me say it. Um, you know, we just, we were, we, we were just awarded a grant um, from the, uh, from the uh, Urban Institute and, and the uh, Arnold Ventures Foundation um, to take a look at the culture, not only the culture of the employees, but the culture of the population to try to figure out how we can do better. And uh, that's going to be focused on one facility and I'll wait for the press release to come out. Those are the kind of forward thinking things that are going on inside corrections. These things that happen shouldn't be happening, and they'll be dealt with um, as long as I'm sitting in the chair as the interim commissioner. So I'm hoping that helps in the background. So you have a 40-year perspective in terms of, it's an outside perspective, being from law enforcement, bringing folks to facilities. What's your take now in terms of what you saw back then? One, you said there is a real difference in correctional officers now to then. Are you picking up any differences in terms of what the inmate population is? Yeah. So I think, you know, and, and, um, yes. And, and let me frame your question a little bit. My experience in Rowland, um, changed my entire perspective. I, I was probably at one time, even as the colonel, uh, one of the people that would throw ice balls over at corrections, right? 
the guys on furlough, my dad, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes on. Um, I had a different perspective when I was in Rome because we had a corrections, uh, community corrections officer embedded inside the police department. And we worked very closely with corrections. And we really focused on the folks that were doing the most harm. And I got to see the inside of corrections, the way they look at those offenders and how they cooperated with us. And it was a big piece of the way um, we tr drove the crime rate down in Ralph. Um, going back to the offenders, um, you know, at one time, as I was briefed the other day, we used to supervise 12,000 people in the community in all different forms. Mm -hmm. Probation, parole, furlough, you know, and, and I'm, I'm getting caught up on the number of designations that we have for people in the community. I mean, you, you know, you, we, we have to, you know, we have to employ an entire team to figure that out, right? Um, and that's a conversation for the future when I understand it better. But we used to supervise 12,000 people in the community. We're down to seven. A lot of those folks got deflected away. You know, this is the DWI2 guy who gets into, you know, gets into treatment or just realizes it's not a good idea to be driving. Those folks are no longer around corrections. Um, you know, and, 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 and even within the last week, reading daily reports, you know, the population we're supervising in the community, some of it's driven by the opiate crisis. Some of it is driven by the amount of trauma that people have been through in their lives. These are very complicated individuals. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, because none of us, in many cases, would have wanted to live the life that they live. And I have been spending a lot of time getting to understand the population in South Burlington, because that's, that, that's been the target of the conversation. And uh, you know, um, when I visited with Superintendent Stone the other day, you know, we got talking about what's her population look like. You know, a lot of those women have been victims of crime. Uh, they've, been, they've been exposed to a lot of trauma in their life. And coping with what we all cope with every day becomes very difficult. So for us to supervise them becomes very challenging. So I think that's the difference in the population. I also think who's inside the facilities. You know, and I, I don't mean this in a, a very... Um, disrespectful way, but my 40 years, um, you know, if you're in jail in Vermont, um, there's a lot of chances given to you ahead of time. And um, there's a lot of sad stories in the jails, I get that, but um, I think the population is a little bit different. You know, I just, you know, down in your neighborhood, Representative, um, you know, we had a correction officer taken hostage three weeks ago, four weeks ago. You know, I, I saw the video of that. Uh, I saw the video of the assault last night. Um, it is important for us inside facilities to maintain security and order, and we do that through holding people accountable. So it is a little bit more challenging than what it was when Jim Baker was wandering around as a road trooper back in the 70s and 80s. You remember me, don't you, Representative Morris? <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of leads, I got leads to one lot of different questions, both on the inmate side um, in terms of the dynamics that's happening there and also on the staff side too the correctional officers that even back 20 years ago going in and visiting a facility it was very clear that the goal was for security of that facility it's based on security Put them in jail, lock them up, put them in jail. And, and it seems like some of the, that is now changing for the correctional officers, that yes, it's still security, but there's so much human needs in terms of mental health issues, in terms of opioid issues, in terms of trauma issues, and I'm talking for both male and female <coughs> inmates. Yeah, it's only on the trauma piece. I'll just give an example of, of the South Carolina facility, but trauma is a big piece of what's going on inside the facilities. All facilities. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering how can we help the staff, correctional officers and even shift supervisors, caseworkers, superintendents, ex expand or grow into a different culture? 
we got we got work to do on this, okay? But let me let me tell you this. Um, Heather Simons is over here. She's one of our senior leadership team um, who's responsible for the academy. I'm going to the academy next week to meet with the recruits who are in the academy. And you know, I'm gonna deliver a message to them about what I said to you about setting a standard and setting a bar. Um, I think we're moving that way. Uh, the challenge is, um, I don't know about anybody here, but I'm not sure I'd go into a facility and work with some of the forced overtime at 18 bucks an hour. Um, we have to have a bigger conversation about who we're hiring mm -hmm. and how we're hiring them. Mm -hmm. And again, under Heather's leadership, uh, we just took two folks and, and started a recruiting unit. I'm just starting to get my head wrapped around that. Let's get loose. They're taking, um, they're taking the lead and being coached um, by um, my, my friends at the state police, about how the state police recruit. Um, I haven't quite had the time to get my head into the hiring process. I do see issues already with the way we hire. Um, I, mean, I was running late here because I, I've been all morning staffing disciplinary issues um, with employees. And again, it's a little discouraging to walk out of there because I even started buying into everybody, but it's not everybody. Um, you know, as the HR people I talk us through it, it it's, uh, it's reoccurring issues with folks. And I think this goes to your point about the turnover happens so quickly uh, and I'm gathering this already, and I'm not, I'm not giving you a definitive view of this, but I'm starting to gather this from watching and talking to folks. We are promoting folks into first-line supervisor roles so quickly that they don't have a lot of experience in first-line supervision. Now, I don't understand corrections the way I understand law enforcement. But I understand systems pretty well. And everywhere I've been, where I've been asked to come in, at the end of the day, it's first-line supervision. Those are the folks that hold folks accountable. You know, I remember when I was a colonel of the state police, I got asked to go do a presentation at Green Mountain Coffee to an in-service class about leadership. And before the class, I was talking to the gal that did the leadership, and I said, what's your problem? She said, our first-line supervisors. Hey, me too. You know, it's where it happens. It's where when I'm home at bed, at night, they set the standard inside the facilities. And I think we have work to do around that. But I gotta tell you, in the last three to five years, based on what I was briefed by Commissioner Touchette and, and Heather and other folks, a lot of effort is going into exposing people to leadership training and setting a new standard. We gotta stop the turnover in order to get staff stabilized so we can build that level of experience and expectations that will hold people accountable in the right way. That makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. So, if you talk, you know, I have correctional officers that live in my district and you see them in the stores and in your neighborhood and I make an effort to reach out to them and ask questions because mm -hmm. they're off the clock. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hear quite often is they, they feel that they don't have, nobody has their back. They don't have the backup, and I ask that I ask specifically, who doesn't have your back? Who do you feel doesn't have your back? Is it central office, or is it within the facility? Mm -hmm. And they'll say it's within the facility. Mm -hmm. It's either the shift supervisor or the superintendent, and you dig in a little deeper than that, and you hear, well, you know, you really after. You know, you're dealing with inmates, and you can try to change some of the behavior. So you issue DRs, and those get grieved, they get resolved one way or another, issue another DR, and finally you might get pressure from the higher ups in the facility, hey, don't do that anymore. And they say, well, what are we supposed to do as correctional officers? The people who are in charge aren't, don't even back us up. So that's contributing to feeling demoralized. Mm -hmm. um, and the overtime feeds into that. And when I was told the price of overtime this year, they had to lift me off the floor. I was shocked. 
it's not healthy. No, it's not. It's not good. I mean, never mind it's taxpayer money. I get that. But uh, it's the morale we, of the we staff. Have, look, sleep deprivation is a serious thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very serious thing. And I've done a fair amount of research and work on that when I was in D.C. I understand it. It's very serious. Let me let me touch on something, uh, Representative Edwards, that you're talking about. The superintendents and the district managers will be in the office on Friday, and I'll be visiting with them to talk about my expectations. Now, look, I run the risk of they may have on their iPads a program counting down the days that I'm gone. I, <laughs> I understand that. Uh, but I'm a pretty persistent guy, as you know. Uh, I, I've been to the South Burlington facility already, and I'll, I'll be going to the academy next week. And I'm going to be doing a site visit at every institution and every district office <coughs> to include focus groups with the employees by the end of February. And uh, to get a sense from them, like you got a sense. And that, you know, when I do the focus group, it'll be without local management in the room. Um, I, I, I do think, and I'll say this, uh, and I don't. I've said this a couple times as some folks in the building already privately. I would just caution you about this is a serious challenge in state government. Mm -hmm. Very serious. The work that's done is, is very serious work. I think the type of inmate and folks that we take in our custody, that's not going to get any better. I mean, you all know this. You know what the opioid crisis is doing, you know the level of trauma that's induced in the family introducing into families. We know what's happening inside schools. So we've got to get better at our programming, and I had this conversation the other day. Um, it, it's, 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 not going to get, it's not going to get much better. And um, we're going to have to find ways as an organization to figure out um, a new form of program that deals with folks that are in those situations. Because at the end of the day, and I'll go back to my Rutland days, you know, the folks that we were working with in conjunction are, are we said to them all, we want you to do well in the community. We're here to give you everything you need to do well, best we can. If not, there's consequences. And I, and I, and I do think, I do think that um, in the mid-management level, I'm gathering day six already, there is a certain amount of fear amongst them to do their job uh, just because of the kind of pressure that exists in the system about how many do we have inside, how many are in Mississippi, what's the overtime cost. Um, I, I would just caution you that as, as we move forward and have this discussion during a session, please don't look for political answers to a systematic problem. A political answer is not going to resolve this. It's going to kick the can down the road. and. Uh, you know, some of the staff are still in the room have heard me say this several times, that a political answer will not produce a long-term uh, outcome that's going to produce better citizens and not better inmates. And we got to get really serious about it, and it's going to cost money. Um, the type of folks that we're programming back in the community on furlough, um, we're, we're using modalities um, as far as clinical support, that's from 15 years ago. And we have to rethink that. And uh, that's why, you know, the criminal justice reinvestment, um, we're all in on that. Corrections is all in. We want to find a way to do better. And at the same time, we got to hold our folks accountable that have made messes for our organization. Well, DOC is not in isolation. DOC is, is not in isolation. It is part of the bigger picture. It's part of our community systems. That's right. And it's not just corrections an issue to resolve this. Right. You, know, you may have heard Secretary Smith already say this, but I'll say it for you. This is not just a DOC issue. It's an AHS issue. Um, mental health and addiction and DCF and kids. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a system-wide problem that's got to be looked at system-wide. It's too early to have you answer this, I'm sure, uh, and the overtime piece you spoke about quite a few, a lot. 
because it does create problems within the correctional, uh, within the correctional officers and the people within the facility. A few years back, we were using a, a, a large number of temporary uh, employees, and we authorized some more positions. And I'm assuming now that those positions are currently unfilled, plus more. So. Up, up, up. Well, no, we're getting, I mean, I think we're getting better. I mean, the problem is we're getting folks in the door. It's what's going out the back door. And I think we got, I mean, I'm going to say this again. I mean, Heather's here, and I want, I want to credit her for this. This piece about the way we're going to recruit is going to be a big part of uh, It's a career. It's not a place just to stop. So what, what do we do to bridge through this process that we've got people working way, way too many hours? Uh, you know, how have you thought about, and it may not have yet, how do we bridge to, till you get the, <coughs> the, 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 the new calorie coming in? Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking a lot about it, but I wish I had the solution I don't right now. Okay, so, I, I expected that answer. But, I gotta tell you, when it comes to the staff, it's my biggest concern. It's just not safe. Thank you. And for any change that occurs in the world, staffing world, we're going to need buy-in from the current staff. Right. And that may be difficult because they may feel their job is threatened. Right. And there's a fine balance in, in uh, advocating for them, which I will all the time, and hold, you know, and hold them accountable. Um, I would love to get, if I had time, to get my heads around work performance, misconduct issues, and sleep that. I know in my law enforcement days there's a direct correlation between conduct of police officers uh, and and sleep deprivation. There's a very clear connection there. You think there's also sleep deprivation from the inmates on the inmates end too, or not? It's hard to say. Hard to say, but but again, you know, they're human beings. It's pretty stressful being in jail. You know, I've already seen. A boodle of emails from moms worrying about their children in jail. Yeah. And how much are our facilities and the shape of our facilities and layout of our facilities contributing to some of this? I don't claim to be an expert, but I, you know, what well, you, you all you all know this. Your institutions, corrections, that self building facilities, something's got to happen. I think we have to be cautious about. Not building a building for the sake of a building. You know, I was I was in my one of my first meetings and I said, Well, at least we got a new facility in Springfield. They all looked at me like new facility <laughs> thing's twenty years old. Is it that old already? <laughs> twenty is it correct, Heather? Twenty years yeah, old? Yeah, I think it is, nineteen. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's a bigger I don't I don't have the answer to that either, but you know, again, um, if you're going to shift to that 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 kind of work that I talked about, the modality of support that needs to be done, um, you need the facility to be able to do that. And as I understand it from talking to staff, you know, moving people inside a facility that's not designed to move people requires staff. It's 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 it requires staff. And so when you start talking about overtime, you can't you can't cut corners on what you've got for staff because you can't lose control of the facility. Questions? Questions? Carl? Kirk. 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 <laughs> I'm gonna make Go ahead and get him a hat. <laughs> I'm gonna call him Taylor. I have a Kirk. Hey, there you go. You wear this? <laughs> <laughs> there is a solution we could just switch. Yeah. I'll be Carl. Um, can you, you, what is the role of a corrections officer? How would you write a job description for a corrections officer? I'm not trying to pun on this, sir, right? But six days. I, I, I mean, I think this is one of the challenges we have because the job sounds like it's a simple job, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. And what the old version is, where I think some of the culture bleeds into, is jails, and our jails are built this way. Jails were built to put people in jail and hold them. And so guards were nothing more than what the title is, right? A guard. Um, <clears throat> corrections officers today, uh, 
I mean, just because of the difficulty of the type of situations that we have, they have to have de-escalation skills. They've got to be quick on their feet. They've got to have a certain level of courage, not only facing danger, but courage when it comes to uh, making sure boundaries, the lines don't get disappear between the relationship between the staff. Um, they need to understand the law. Um, they have to, I mean, I know that the staff has been in talk to you about Priya. Um, they have to understand the boundaries of that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's fairly complicated. And, you know, um, the trouble is the job market, and, I'm, you know, I, I have to be careful because I, you know, I, I do represent the administration, but the job description and what we pay people is challenging. And I, I think it's got to be a bigger conversation. Because, um, you know, I, to go back to my law enforcement days to kind of like help you think the way I think about this, what well, used to be what a trooper was in 1978 when I came on, um, you spent most of your class doing self-defense. Moving forward, police agencies, and I know this from my work in the country, are they're, they're a uh, social services delivery system now. And that takes an entirely different individual to shift from that warrior mentality to that guardian mentality in the community. And if I could wave my wand to straighten out the situations that we have that are hurting us, I would want the people to be guardians of the people we're responsible for, warriors when they need to be, and social workers when it calls for that as well. So how do you do that at $18 an hour? Yeah. It's challenging. And with the, with but the I, but I, I got to tell you, the staff has <coughs> built a very solid six weeks, Heather? Five, five, five weeks of academy. I think, you know, eventually we'll have to look at expanding the academy. Um, and there's some great training that goes on there to start building that. And we do get good candidates through the door. But, mm -hmm. you know, we lose them and we're not retaining them. It's not that we're losing everybody, but can we lose some good talent at the door? So uh, if I had that answer, I would implement it, and I'd, I'd be gone before April 30th. But I mean, I think we've got to work that out. And I do think getting guidance from folks, stakeholders that have an interest in what we do is important. Well, we're giving him a break so, so he can get, at least get his feet on the ground. Yeah, I can't wait to come back in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the committees? I know you're going over to Senate GovOps. What are the committees on the House side? Uh, have you been? Well, I mean, I think there's a certain element of House GovOps, right? I hope. I mean, clearly, I'll have my turn in the hill at the end of the month in appropriations. Because mm -hmm. um, we can't do this in this committee alone. No, and I think, I mean, I I want to reemphasize this, right? Is that um, this is not just a corrections issue. It's, it's, a system, it's a systematic issue that has to be looked at systematically. And yes, there's these nuances about staff and who you hire and how you train them and how you retain them. Um, you, you know, as difficult as that is, that's kind of in the big scheme of things. That's low hanging fruit in the big scheme of things. It's about about a systematic approach to, uh, you know, entire different version of, of how we transition people back into being productive citizens. So, I mean, mental health is a big piece of this. How about gang activity within the facilities? Mm -hmm. Is that starting to surface? Mm -hmm. And again, as you know, because you've been doing this longer than I have, it's our concern about out of state, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's you know, and look, mm -hmm. I you know listen to the stories of the folks that have the national picture inside corrections that know what corrections agencies in other states look like, and I'm not saying I'm going to lower the bar to the standard. I'm not. Um, we're doing we're doing pretty well with the way our staff handles things and the level of professionalism that they do their business with. And those are those outlier staff that 
have embarrassed the agency and we need to deal with them. Um, because in some states, um, you know, organized crime runs rampant inside facilities. Um, we do have concerns and you know, you know, I think in the future we need to talk a little bit more about um, that and there's a lot of diversion going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think we have to revisit that. You know, I talked to Senator Sears about that a little bit, about potential adjusting the legislation. Um, I'm all about treatment. People need treatment. Um, but we got to be careful. Diversion starts to become criminal activity inside a facility, and then people gain power as a result of that. And, you know, bad things can happen. So we have to be careful about that. So I'm assuming you will be developing some initiatives that would need legislative input and legislative help and direction. Um, so I would say, our doors open? My doors open as well. Yeah, and please. And I'm not hard to find. My email is. Pretty much a standard email, james.baker at vermont.gov. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, the folks that know me know that I have a deep respect for this process. I have mm -hmm. a deep respect for what goes on in this building. I understand the role of that. Um, I just ask that we work collectively together to try to work with some of these issues. And if you have legislation or thoughts, I think it would be really important because all committees work in silos say we don't want to but it's the nature of the beast but we could help in working with our colleagues be it in Judiciary Committee in the House be it government operations be it appropriations to have them to work with them to see the bigger picture also Human Services Committee because they oversee the Agency of Human Services and we might be able to be the conduit thinking this is DOC's problem and only DOC, yeah. and it is not. And the more we make it that, it's the more of the political answer that I said before. It's not the systematic change. And the more we do that, the more pressure there is on the system inside corrections. And we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, look, you know, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but a couple of facilities are under a lot of pressure from staffing wise. And, you know, um, and I'll have a better idea of that as I travel around the state. Kurt? Um, I think I've, we're not allowed to ask questions. We already know the answer to it, at least on the floor. But anyway, do you do you um, do you feel you have the resources that you need to do your job? Um, and I, I'm not answering this because of why you think I'm answering. <laughs> okay, good. I didn't want you to answer the way that I thought you might. I mean, you are. You all know the governor's address hasn't come out yet. Right. Yeah. I work for the governor. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'll give you. I'll give you the answer I gave when I went into law. You know, I, I think Representative Shaw could back up. Things were so bad there that they would have gave me a helicopter, hundred cops. I could have. I could have had a bulletproof car with a driver. And this is what I said to, to, to the mayor in the board of aldermen. Um, I don't know yet. I'll let you know, and I'll say the same thing to you. I don't know. Um, and it could end up that where we need help isn't in the obvious place. It could be in places like uh, better understanding data to make better decisions. I'm a huge guy on data, and that may not be a fancy thing. And I'm just using this as an example. I'm not saying it's the answer. Um, I may say we need another data person at the central office because the data person will help us better manage the system, which takes pressure off the system, takes pressures off the employees, cuts down on our overtime. Um, I'm just using that as an example, but I don't, I don't have the answer for you today. Okay. Anything else? Today. Not today, huh? Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> it's good to see you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anytime. I'll be back. No, I'm sure. Yeah. And we'll have you back. Well, at least let you have get a chance to get your legs under you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we want to take a quick break before we transition? Some air in the room? Yeah. Change the air. So, I'm going to.
that would suck. Have our <laughs> conversation about Priya again. One thing is, I heard back from Eric Fitzpatrick. We talked about the definition Sorry, that's okay. of Priya, <coughs> um, the definition of rape, sexual assault. We have a definition on the books in Vermont, sexual assault. In Priya, there's a definition of rape. We wanted to see if they were defined differently or the same. And Eric uh, responded back with, um, with me yesterday and said, yes, they are defined the same. And on the Priya and federally stating. That was one of our questions last week. Great. So. Heather, Heather, Jen, Heather. Heather. Yeah, yes. Heather. <laughs> jump, jump right in. Sure. Well, sort of. One thing that we talked about with um, both Jen and Heather is a broader review of Korea on the state level, <coughs> folks. And then also working down through certain topics within Korea. And we thought also it might be good to start because there was so much interest from committee members about the audit. So we would start there, but there'd be more conversations at a later date with all the other issues within Priya. So I'll turn it over to you, Heather. Okay. And you can lead us on. All right. Oh, well, thank you very much. My name is Heather Simons. I work for the Department of Corrections. I'm the Director of Training and Professional Development. Um, and thank you to the committee and Chair Evans for allowing me to spend this time talking about not just the PREA audits, but the process for which these standards for the Prison Rape Elimination Act were developed. And I know last week we started to take a bit of a dive, a deeper dive into the dynamics around victimization and trauma, um, conditions <coughs> of climate in terms of that ha how that impacts the population that lives in residences, um, facilities especially. We know um, through the audit process that these standards apply not just to our facilities, but also to um, Woodside and um, any, any confinement housing. So we'll, we're going to have more discussion about that as time goes on. But really what uh, my assignment was for today was to take some time and um, review the background and the process and do an overview of how the Prison Rape Elimination Act um, post Eric's briefing on each standard uh, attaches itself to operations and corrections facilities and in correction, correctional <coughs> environments. And part of that discussion would be around literally what is the, um, the culture of a correction setting in regards to the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, I said it last week and I probably will say it every time I'm invited here if I'm invited back <laughs> after today. <coughs> But again, the spirit of this work and these standards were written in, the, in um, the most important statement, which is that prison rape should never be considered part of a sentence. And that we know that the cultural aspects of the work we have to do is going to be what drives everything else, no matter what laws we have, um, no matter how many policies we create, this needs to be leadership owned and culture supported. And uh, to speak briefly about what Commissioner Baker was talking about, all of those things are, would be considered pre-related matters, recruitment, retention, backgrounds, um, uh, corrections fatigue, which is a term that has been coined that captures a different kind of burnout that's not compassion fatigue, but um, that envelops what uh, an officer or another staff person might experience over their career. It might be considered um, primary trauma in that you have an incident that you're part of, or it could be secondary trauma, which is really kind of what we've been talking about, the slow erosion of what happens when you work in this business for a long time. And I'm barely scratching the surface, but these are topics that are also related to the Prison Rape Elimination Act and that we can't pay attention to one thing, we have to pay attention to everything. And that's a tall order, particularly if uh, we're shy on resources or shy on staff. From the audit perspective, we have, we reviewed the audits. It's been a while. We have another set 
of audits starting in February at Chittenden. What, we, um, what I decided to do for today, because it would take us literally all day if we went line by line through each facility audit, what I wanted to do is tell you what the topics are that are considered and the way they do the audit, and then touch on the challenges, because that came up last week, some of the areas where we may have not met the, uh, the audit standard, but then remediated in that 180-day window and fixed what the challenge was. So. How pre-audits are a little bit different is that it's not just a paper audit. It's an audit of policy. It's an audit of training, of inmate education, health services, equipment, security, staffing. And it's also not just a paper audit in that we, do, they, we upload all of our documents ahead of time. So before a federal auditor comes to visit us, they will ask for all of our proof documentation, is what it's called, uh, that shows that we follow each of the standards. And um, I think there's roughly like 40, 40 <coughs> two or three actual PREA standards, and then there's a ton of substandards underneath that. We will show um, each area from a PREA audit survey that's sent to us. Uh, we will have to show proof before the auditor gets here that we are doing what we are supposed to be doing. So in other words, if we're supposed to be uh, delivering specific training, we'll show documentation that we are. But when the auditor is here and visiting a facility, um, he or she will arbitrarily stop any staff person of any rank and ask a question related to that section of the PREA audit. So it's also a live audit. and. Um, that uh, includes focus groups and random questions to the offender population. That's the most basic overview, and you can please stop me if you have questions as we go. What I'd like to do now is review some of the areas where we were remediated so we could talk about the complexities of what might happen if we're, miss if we're missing a mark on one or two of the standards. Okay. So, are any of these documents that have been submitted and posted up here pertaining to your testimony right now and where you're headed? Yes, and I'm just not click on to maybe. Yes. <laughs> Oops, that's not it. Yes. Are we good? Okay. So, at the top there. You can see um, these are the start dates of the first round of audits uh, started in um, February of uh, 2017. All of our facilities passed the audit. This is important to note. We were one of the few states that um, were able to show that we uh, completed and passed all of our audits. There are some states and a large number of facilities in this country where they haven't even started the process. Also, um, that this work is daunting. So if how many, you know, what your, what your inmate population is, that's really going to matter. So uh, if you're, I have a colleague who I train with, her name is Kathy Allison, and she's the undersecretary of Department of Corrections in California. We've had many discussions about the process for PREA audits, PREA standards, and how to manage that. Well, she's in charge of 155,000 inmates, so it's a little bit different game. So, what, um, so when I talk today about how we fit culture into this process, I'm also going to bring you some perspective from some folks that I've worked in and some prisons that I've visited. Just, um, on some, of, um, I also do consulting for the National Institute of Corrections and have trained Korea in other states and had some other experiences in terms of how challenging and complex this can be. For example, um, I've had a, you know, I've done some training at Rikers, for example, and that's a different experience than it might be in Vermont, but the audit process is the same. They, for example, have just barely begun, and we are going into our second round of second audit cycles, and um, we feel pretty confident today. The, if you go down to number one, 115.13, that's the audit, that is the standard number. This is not 
um, this is not one facility. What we did is we took all of the areas where we had challenges so it could give you kind of a sound bite of what this conversation looks like and explain what the process was. So supervision and monitoring. This requires that we use video monitoring. Um, during that first round of audits, our, our auditor said that we had specific blind spots in our facilities and we needed to make changes with our cameras. This is not new news, particularly for anyone who's visited um, places like Windsor. Blind spots are the theme. So um, it's not that we were avoiding putting cameras in places, but these, if, uh, these items also are not covered by uh, grants. So there is grant money. It's not used for equipment. It has to be used for uh, sustaining training and capacity. So Heather, let me interrupt right there, just so we can read the chart based on your statement just now about the camera mm -hmm. uh, blind spots in Windsor. So that wasn't Windsor, I'm sorry, I, I just... I know, okay. I know, but it just brought up when I'm looking. So <coughs> in Chittenden there was an on-site audit look-see on um, February 27, 2017, the on-site inspection completed March 1st, mm -hmm. and then the re interim report was 3-30-2017, and I'm taking it that full compliance was reached in August of 2018. So, so there was some remediation that needed to occur within that time frame. Is that the way to interpret that, or is it, and the same with Southeast State, March 31st 2017 yeah. was the completion was the interim report and then the full compliance was August 1st 2017 yeah. so that time frame that difference between the interim report date and the full compliance is that in, to be interpreted there was some remediation that needed to occur or there, not there was remediation in every facility but our superintendents are all business so it's quite likely that the second they knew that there needed to be remediation they fixed their problem but the final report might not have been submitted reviewed and approved until August of uh, 18 and that's what you're looking at is that 180 window which is why all those dates are different because um, each audit started and ended at, at a different time in terms of the, the, the three-year camera plan addressing needs for 14 additional cameras, that was just, that literally was find the money and get the cameras. Keep going? Okay. Uh, that is a typo. The first one should be 2017. That is my mistake. Oh, August, August of 2017. That is an issue. Oh, oh I didn't even catch that. I realized it when <laughs> Chair Evans said it. I was like, that is supposed to be 17. It did not take us over a year to fix that. <laughs> so the, uh, the Chittenden should be 2017. Okay. Thank you for not embarrassing me. No. Oh, so math in public. Does that make sense? I said, don't do math in public. <laughs> um, 11514, youthful offenders. This requires sight and sound separation between youthful offenders and adults. Um, bottom line is, it's very hard to separate um, youthful offenders from adult offenders. So, uh, the provision for this is that we have to have direct supervision, meaning we have to have staff eyes on a youthful offender if they're going to be in a mixed population. A mixed population obviously means an adult. The, um, the design behind this is that we also have to pay very close attention to make sure that youthful offenders don't miss anything because of this. So if you don't have enough staff, that doesn't mean they miss education. They don't miss recreational services. They don't miss ch um, religious services. This standard um, is important. Um, and you'll see other standards where we are reminded when you fix your problem, you cannot fix your problem at the expense of the resident. So and can I interrupt again? You sure can. Youthful offenders, what age group at this point in time was this covering? So the PREA standard is 18 <coughs> and the Vermont State Youthful Offender, I understand, is 21. No, it's moving in tw to 21. Okay. So. If we should close Woodside 
and we have 16 year olds, 17 year olds that may need a secure unit. You may not be the person to answer this question. We may need a secure unit. And what I have heard through the grapevine from the end of November and through December was, oh, well, we can probably place them at a facility, a correctional facility, as long as they have sight and sound separation. If we're already having trouble with this, with youthful offenders who are 18, 19, who are charged as an adult and treated as an adult and convicted as an adult and serving their sentence in an adult facility, though they're considered a youthful offender, how are we going to do this with a 16 or 17 year old? Uh, long term and in, in an ideal way, I don't think I should be the one weighing in. And it's not because I'm right. afraid. I'm not slightly afraid, but it. I really don't think on the subject matter. But that could be in violation of our pre standards. It's a consideration. In this particular case, Jen, can you talk about what we did with the, we covered the window, right? Yeah, in this particular case, there was a, a window in the um, unit and it allowed other inmates to be able to see. So they covered the window and had a curtain. Um, so the youthful offender was within the? Correct. And couldn't look out? Uh, correct. And then because there is not sound separation, the, they had to be on constant observations by security staff. So then that puts pressure on our staffing because I don't have that staff person can't be used elsewhere in the unit. So if we close Woodside and use corrections as a fallback, just spook the pot, folks. One fifteen fifteen limits to cross gender viewing and searches. Cross gender searches of females only to be done in exigent circumstances. Um, this is this is a very meaty discussion across the country. We have to be very specific about what we mean by exigent circumstances. Not having enough staff is not an exigent circumstance, and we will not pass our audits if we say that's the reason that we're not doing uh, cross gender searches properly. And this is, again, it doesn't matter what facility and what state that I visit, this has been a conversation across the country. So we just always don't have enough staff, and so we've got to figure that out. Cross-gender search is being done on intake due to lack of female staff. So what we did is we changed the policy stating that lack of female staff is not an exigent circumstance. We changed the policy, but the solution also is complex so what do we do um, sometimes the inmate may have to wait uh, in fairness I think there's been times where they haven't been searched um, when we do make sure that um, and we do make sure that we have uh, females doing searches on females this is just food for thought um, there's an impact on our workforce as well. So in an organization that has um, much fewer women than men, and you're always the female officer, always doing searches, um, it can be burdensome. And it's not, ex I would say, not exactly fair and something for us to think about. Also note that um, <coughs> This is not a flip standard, so females can search males. And to go back to um, exigent circumstances, we do need to pay attention to what we mean by that, and that's usually something very Im imminent, and it has to be an imminent security risk. So an imminent security risk for a female staff person to search a male <coughs> offender. That doesn't need to be exigent uh, for a male to search a female. Those ex exigent circumstances would be like you feel very confident that there's contraband. So if you're a male correctional officer, you could search a female offender, inmate, if you had a strong feeling that there was contraband. Well, I probably shouldn't use the feeling. You know, you need to be able to explain what your evidence is, what you are seeing, and what is making it an urgent matter right at that time. You cannot, it can't be, I just 
felt like it or thought she should or did. So what is the proof that the officer had that, whatever you pronounce it, exigent circumstances? Is it the officer's word or is there a witness to that? Well, um, let me, do you have, you have a few examples, right? Can you give one? Yeah. Um, just to be clear, when Heather says contraband, she's not talking about tobacco, which we right, know in a correctional right. facility is common. <laughs> it could We're be a weapon, about, it could be drugs. It, but it has to be directly connected to safety. So just because someone has, like, a small amount of marijuana, that's not necessarily a safety risk. The PREA standards are very clear that it has to be a safety risk. Mm -hmm. So if a staff member is witnessing something that's a safety risk, either they just watched a person swallow contraband or insert contraband or um, they had uh, intelligence that said that the person had a weapon, um, then at that point they're going to be calling an emergency uh, over the radio because we have a protocol for that. Uh, and so they're not an officer, I'm not just going to walk up to Heather and say I think you have something that's unsafe and do a search. I would, our protocols would say we have to notify the supervisor, it's a group response, and there would be then witnesses for that entire uh, occurrence, so it would never just be a single person's word. So in that kind of a situation, which is rare, it's going to be rare. In the women's facility, there might be a female officer that would, when the call goes out, there'd be a female officer maybe that also would come to that unit. So it would be incumbent on that female correctional officer to do the search if needed. Correct. If there isn't a female correctional officer at that point, then because of the circumstance it comes to that level, then a male officer could do the search. Is that the same in a male facility where, say, the only officers that show up are female and there are no male officers? Would the female officer then do the search on the male offender? Yeah, because the, the PREA standards don't require same-sex search searches in male facilities. Same sex and female facilities. Oh, I can make a comment. No, Felicia's got a question. So, um, Felicia has a question. Um, yes. Good question. Um, just on that section, um, do you keep records of how many searches were done under? Accident circumstances? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many have been done since the nope. remediation? No. I, I mean, we can find out. I'm pretty sure if you ask me any questions that say, do you know how many, I won't. <laughs> I just won't have it. But we okay. can get it. Yeah. I'd be really curious, um, not at all to imply any mistrust, but just seeing how effective the new policy was and how well kind of it was tracked and we can yeah. kind of keep an eye on that. Yeah, so effective in making sure that the population is safe. As well as our our staff yeah. in, in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd just like to know kind of how many instances are we in a case where it's circumstances where they have to be searched now, where it is a threat to themselves or others. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm curious to be there. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll just get that, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So, if, as you continue, if you could just scroll oh, up, because it's behind you, Heather, and then, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Needs a coach okay, we have another question. <laughs> we have another question, Heather. Yes. Butch? Thanks. <coughs> so, cross gender searching, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any time when anybody is searched with by just one correction officer, be it male or female, if they had to do a, a, a search. Just regular pass search, yeah. Yeah. So there's never Correct. two. Yeah, that's, that's right. regular, yeah. Okay, so there's never two two officers, unless it's a female that's being searched and there's only a male. No, one female officer can search one right, but, female. But can one male officer search one female? Uh, I can't imagine it, what the circumstance would be because if it's exigent, it means that it's a security risk and more people will be involved. But I need to, okay, yeah. Just to, because I'm curious yeah. because you said it doesn't the same as it isn't the same thing for males as it is for females. That's right. Okay, and 
staff announcing. So, staff announces, yeah. yeah. So before we go, before we go to that one, yeah, yeah. does Priya allow? You have the federal standard of Priya, which the state has to adopt and carry out. Can the state go stronger than the federal Priya? Yes. You can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on that. Can't go below it. Correct. But we can go stronger. Correct. Okay. Um, to the cross gender searches and the knock and announce, um, th this is a process. And again, I'll c continue to refer to things like this as a national discussion because it's controversial. It doesn't seem um, equitable that um, that women can search men, but only women search females. Um, I think from a workforce perspective, it seems sort of obvious that the, that the female staff are getting kind of robbed either way, right? Because you're going to do them at the male facility and you're going to be the one doing all of them at the female facility. So that has been... And I'm not weighing in either way from a value statement perspective, but has been part of what the impact is on the culture. So when you go backwards and talk about things like recruitment and retention efforts, what makes this job appealing to women, for example, that's, that, that's part of the conversation. Also, um, the reason why, you know, the reason why um, crushed under um, same-sex searches is required is be obviously because of uh, trauma history and the trauma that women have experienced and the research that's been done in terms of what that might trigger for them and oftentimes the uh, perpetrator of their tra trauma has been male and so that, that, I mean, it's much more complex than that but that's really fr at the foundation. To continue that um, conversation in terms of what uh, what we all across the country weighed in on in this area is that um, for some women working with a male officer in a facility who's good and professional and has his compass set in the right direction this may be the first um, pro-social, positive, safe male authority figure that they have <coughs> experienced, and that experience can be very powerful. And um, so there is, I mean, there is um, a legitimate mindset with professionals who don't totally agree with the same-sex supervision and same-sex searches for those reasons that we are missing an opportunity to cultivate a culture where men are trusted and can be trusted and should be trusted because they are trustworthy <coughs> and good um, and you know, would look a lot like other professions where like the medical profession, your doctor mm -hmm. might be male. So I just want to, the reason why I am weighing in on this is because nothing is this simple in terms of um, meeting, exceeding, or not meeting these standards. Mm -hmm. So we have some more questions. Sarah, I so, um, um, since this was, this was based on 2003, I mean the law was right? well, 13 Thir and, then, and then went 2012. 2012. I, I guess my question is coming from this cross gender. We have um, for for inmates or officers who might identify as LGBTQ. How does how do, is that factored in IA? Or you, um, uh, how does that factor into this, or how does that land on the on the um, folks who are implementing it, or is, is it an issue in the facilities in Vermont? It is. Um, I wasn't going to go too far into it today because I think um, what might may come out of today is that we'll have <coughs> some other topics. Um, but the care and custody of LGBTQ um, offender population should be its own presentation, I think. Um, Jen Spracky is our ladies trainer in that. You, were, were you here? Last session yeah. we, we had Jen um, gave us yeah, but that, into that. Um, on the most basic level, we uh, have to incorporate um, those standards, but also um, the cultural implications of that. And that is not just for the offender population, but also we need to be more inclusive in terms of how we recruit and um, how we educate 
and uh, keep up with their policies. I'd probably be, um, I should probably stop there, though. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I get it. I get it. But anyway, I'm, I'm interested in another time. Perfect. Just a, a quick question. If we're talking about uh, pat-down searches rather than strip searches or such, um, are we talking about usually being in an area where there's a camera? Yes. Um, are all searches always with a camera? Oh, no. Okay. Even just pat-down searches are they're not necessarily in an area where there's a camera. The desired is usually to have them, you know, in a hallway, but again, it depends on the, the key. There is no direction to staff that says that you must complete the search in view of the camera. Okay. I can't imagine, but maybe you do a strip search in the hallways, you wouldn't be doing a strip no. search in the hallways. <laughs> no. I was a pat search. Right. Pat search you would, but a strip. So that strip search, male or female, in the, is that done where there's a camera or not? Not necessarily, no. Is there another officer there witnessing? No. So it's just an officer and the inmate. If that's a strip search. Correct. If it's pat down, that's something different. It can be done more visibly and it could be more people around. Offender, offender and inmate and staff. Yeah, the strip searches aren't always done on video camera for, I mean, people deserve some version of privacy, privacy. Is, the, is the main reason. So there's a balance there in terms of the inmate privacy mm -hmm. versus inmate security. Mm -hmm. Does Prius um, speak at all to those <coughs> searches being done, a strip search, it's a tongue twister, mm -hmm. being done in private or not? Are they silent on that? Is Priya silent on that? Do you know? Um, I don't think so. I'm That's left up more to the state and the policy of the department. The thing that would speak to it is the privacy, that the standards have an overall flavor of to keep things as, <coughs> as private as possible in regards to anything. Okay, so what? Might jump in front of anything. So is it good policy to do a one on one strip search? Is it good policy good public policy to do a one on one strip search out of the eyes of the camera? I, I um, think it's safer to do it. I assume that it may be safer emotionally, but I don't know. The reason why I am giving you all of the perspectives that I know about is that um, I can't weigh in on the camera situation. It, that I don't think um, I should. I just don't know enough. I think my, what might be helpful is if you quickly just, Jen, if you don't mind, just sort of name the circumstances where we would be doing pet searches, like transfers, coming back from court, coming back from the hospital. Mm -hmm. Some pretty standard stuff. Anything else? Uh, transferring out of units, um, coming out of the chow hall, if there's concern, people are stealing food. Um, if you got intelligence that said something may have been passed in a program, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's for pet down. That's right. for pet down. So my concerns are not so much with pet down. So it should be, but it's not. It's, it's, it's a strip search. It's strip um, searches. Yeah, and I, I think I heard earlier that you could do a male female strip search. Male as a male CO. Only in an, a male can only strip search. It, it works both ways. A male can only strip search a female in an exigent circumstance, which, the way our policies are, are written, if it was exigent, there's a supervisor involved. There's probably a handheld camera involved because there is a full-scale situation of safety. So, so there be there probably is a use so of it's force. Your policy then to have that happen if the, if the inmate is a female but not necessarily a male? Correct. We, um, female officers can do strip searches on males mm -hmm. um, that would not necessarily be emergent. So you wouldn't need those other safeguards Correct. in place. And I'm Correct. just thinking, I'm thinking safeguards for actually our 
as inmates, but also for our employees as well. Mm -hmm. We have a searches directive. Okay. It's not on me. <laughs> no. <laughs> See, this is what I, I was saying to the committee. <clears throat> it's really important to know what's in place within DOC policy and directives, because it's your directives that determine your policy and your directives that determine how PREA is carried out. Right. There, um, you're going to find that pretty much uh, we'll have a standard and or a directive <clears throat> that follows each of these standards because we're audited on our policies that back these standards up. There has been a lot of updating over the last decade on some of these. Some either didn't exist or some needed to be written from scratch. Like our PREA directive, which is, I think, on the agenda for Thursday with reporting and investigating. The PREA directive 40909 is how many pages? Lots, 30, 40, 30, yeah. yeah. So, I um, said I'm too bored. Yeah. 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 She yeah. said, read this. <laughs> so what would be helpful, possibly, in advance to, um, when you come in next and talking about those specific directives, it would be really helpful <coughs> if you could electronically forward that those directives to Phil. Yeah. Yep. so that he could post that and we can see them as a committee just so folks can see how your directives are laid out because I think for a lot of folks other our colleagues the general public um, there's no knowledge of directives within DOC it's like what are those but that's what your op that's what the operation of DOC is really I don't want to say based on, but that's how you how DOC carries out their policies is through their directives. That's correct. And you have and DOC has directives for everything. Yes, yes, we they do. do. Mm -hmm. Yes, they we do. do. And some need to be updated, and some have been updated. Um, I, and we absolutely will do that. And as um, as this unfolds, um, we have some sense of where we should go next after today. But also, I having been here next. year, last week was anticipating a lot of really good questions and thought it might um, we may change that based on the questions that were coming in I had wasn't planning on reviewing any directive today we kind of mm -hmm. decided to go to the end and go backwards which I really appreciate from this committee that's our final exam um, <coughs> when I start talking about uh, the corrections culture formal and informal and default what you'll hear is that that pre audit survey that we do before auditors come that's really our formal process and by the uh, the time the auditor gets here that should be our test of our culture because when you're walking through a facility and you're asking people questions on the fly and they're comfortable and fluent with the language then we're feeling a lot better about whether this has been embedded and that's what we're shooting for do you want me to keep going with these bullets okay um, and again, so, you know, if this isn't working, let me know. I just wanted to give you an idea of something. Like, these are areas where those boxes were checked, did not need standard, and we wanted you to see that um, it's a little bit complicated, but not none of this is huge and unfixable. Um, staff monitoring cameras, we covered this just a little bit already in terms of privacy when bodily functions are being performed. Um, so, uh, Essentially, what happens here? It's it's an uh, uh, for us. It was about moving cameras, and that took some time. So, if you have uh, a male and main control at Chittenden, I think what the remediation was um, in the beginning, Jen, if I recall, it was um, we covered. Did we cover the camera? We covered the monitor. We covered the, the main monitor. control for the female officer. Um, and, and yeah. the facilities, it's called bathrooming, right? So we either cover the monitor, we eventually will move the camera so it doesn't need to be right on, but it could be just a little bit above the stall. And the idea is that you, need, you see what you need to see to keep, the, to keep the building safe. You don't need to see more than that. And so that, that's what's behind this. So just to... 
committee, my own committee members, when in our capital budget, when it has that general appropriation for DOC, um, not specific towards a facility, but for upgrades, we did fund some of these cameras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. to make that connection over the years. Mm -hmm. Uh, 11533 is inmate education. Um, Eric reviewed this the other day. Uh, education for inmates is a very important piece of this, um, uh, the standards and the audits, and that we need to be, uh, they need to fully understand what their rights are, what their reporting mechanism is, the avenues for which they can report. That they um, need to understand what PREA is, what it means. Um, we need to um, deliver content that's understandable in a way that's under understandable, so it's not always in writing. There's an orientation packet. Uh, there's a survey that is filled out at intake. But ultimately, this section of the audit, we did not pass. Um, we were, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, please, thank you. Oh, too far, too far. Do you want to sit next? Um, so uh, we were completing the orientation, the inmates were getting all of the education that they needed, and then there's a form that they sign off on um, acknowledging that they completed what they needed to. When we uploaded the documents to the PREA auditor, we only scanned one side and the signature side didn't go through, so we did not meet that standard. So we scanned the other side of the form and met the standard. That wasn't that was an easy fix. Yeah, it wasn't fun to tell you, but yeah, it was an easy, <laughs> it was an easy fix. Um, okay, screening. I'm getting good at this now. I think my notes are a little different, right? Because I took more. So. Um, Screening for risk of victimization and abusiveness um, and asking the inmates directly if they identify as LGBTQI. When they first wrote the standards, um, the, the, um, and I think this was originally crafted as far back as the Prison Rate Commission maybe weighed in on it, um, the standard was that um, they could tell us how they identified. And the standard is now that we need to ask how they identify. The, um, the screening tool basically just changed and we needed to update it. And again, this is not as easy as just changing a form. Um, this is a discussion. Is it any of our business? And um, does a person want to tell us? And are they obligated to tell us the truth? And if they don't tell us, um, I, will, I will tell you that the auditors are encouraging us to, to maybe guess. And here's why. We have got to make sure that we um, are acknowledging people who we think might be vulnerable. And this population is vulnerable. And there are other categories of what we would consider a vulnerable population. I sort of liken this to the discussion that BSP has had to have over the years over um, the tickets and fair and impartial policing and identifying rates and things like that. We're not always, not everyone's on the same page. I don't honestly know where I sit with this, whether, you know, if it's sort of my, it's, it's got to be my idea whether I tell you how I identify <coughs> for the purposes of keeping people safe. This is where they landed with the, with the standard. So, we changed the form. 115.52, exhaustion of administrative remedies. Um, this was, um, we were tracking grievances. We switched over from paper over to OMS. I think you've heard about OMS, our offender management system. It's been a little bit of a process, a little bit clunky. It took some time. Um, I think in this particular case, the facility had um, some grievances on paper and had not entered them. The auditor reviewed the grievances. The grievance were, grievances were all there. 
they were all filled out properly. We didn't meet that standard at that particular day because they hadn't been entered yet. And it's understandable. Not, I mean, you know what I mean. Okay. Oh, same standard was um, inmate uh, resident handbook needed to be updated. And this is about uh, inmates' rights to, um, with regards to grievances, which is why it's in the same section, A and B of 7. 8, 115.63, reporting to other facilities. A superintendent where the allegation is made must notify the superintendent of the facility where it allegedly occurred. So if um, uh, inmate Jones from St. Johnsbury goes to Northwest, and he reports to a staff person at Northwest an allegation of some kind of sexual abuse. At the previous facility. At the previous facility. That superintendent is required to communicate. In all cases uh, where there's been a report that's um, been taken in from the receiving facility, that communication happened. But in some cases, it was between the PREA director and the superintendent, or the assistant superintendent might have called the other superintendent. But this is really clear for checks and balances. We need to show proof that the two superintendents email each other or speak to each other. Uh, 115.64, staff first responder duties. There were two incidents during the reporting period where this was not followed. This is uh, staff awareness that perpetrators and victims are to be advised not to shower, brush teeth, or perform bodily functions in order to preserve evidence. Um, I, Jen, I think in this case it was it had been done and not documented and needed to be uploaded. It was it, the facility had done it. The staff that were interviewed were unsure that it was a requirement. That's right. It was. T um, that's right. So. That was one of those on-the-fly um, questions to staff from the auditor walking down the hallway. Do you understand the protocol for this? And they forgot the steps. And um, they were not even necessarily involved in that, right? Correct. Yeah. So, um, so in a situation like that, you may not recall, and this isn't the full fingers of anybody or anything, anything in particular, but for the staff to not be aware or not recall the protocol, is it mostly new staff that come on board that have that or, or not? I'm just trying I think to it's auditor test anxiety. <laughs> it's just like white coat anxiety when you have your blood pressure? It's not. With, um, I, I think when you, if, if you spoke to um, Melinda Allen should say, you know, the sentiment in the facility is that people know what to do. Um, they are willing and they're informed and they're basically pretty fluent and her notes reflect that overall. And in this particular case, I think we just forgot. Okay, uh, protection from retaliation, 115.67. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, now I'm having test anxiety. <laughs> uh, retaliation monitoring um, in terms of documentation. Uh, retaliation monitoring means that once a report is made that um, we need to check in with a person who has made a report and make sure that there are no issues, that there's no um, perceived backlash, no unnecessary pressure. Um, if there is, we need to know about it. The 90 days is the window that we watch for it. And um, from, from the perspective of staff, they're also involved in this too. If they report something and they, and they experience something that they think might be um, in some way um, putting pressure on them because of an allegation, we monitor that as well, site by site. In this particular case, um, is this, we didn't up the, we needed to change, wait. We had forms that either um, someone refused to sign, 
Do we have some refusals? No, that's the next one. Oh, sorry. This is that it was being done, but the forms weren't filled out. No documentation. There was no documentation. Yeah. And whose responsibility was it to fill it out? The officer or the inmate? Uh, that the staff the has staff. to fill that out. Yeah. I don't have a creative answer for that one. We fixed it. <coughs> we fixed it. You know. <laughs> yeah. How do you know it's fixed? Well, because it's 90 day, we have to go back and we have to review. We do mock audits ourselves to get ready for audits. Um, and uh, th all those, again, if it's asked in that pre-audit survey, um, we have to show that we've been doing it. We don't want to find out we're not doing something from the auditor, but I think in that particular case, we did. Is anybody besides DOC taking a look at those mock audits to kind of give you a fresh set of eyes? Or is it the auditor? No. Oh. The, the mock audits that you guys do yourself. Oh. Does anybody else take a look at those, or is it just, again, siloed inside DOC? Um. Like anybody at HS? Right. I, I, I'm, no, I'm pausing over the word silo. I think we are in. We are practicing in good faith, um, but that's a good question. I, I, we don't pull in other agencies to help us with um, getting ready for an audit, but we could. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, a personal perspective that an audit kind of helps you see your blind spots. Mm -hmm. Because um, I don't think that anybody's intentionally missing out on any of these criteria. Um, but with the kind of mock audits or preparatory audits, you might not be seeing your own blind spots, yeah. which is what independent audits are kind of there to help you with. So I don't know if you ever utilized another person with NHS or something at another we department. Have. We switch facilities is, is what we do. We so for example, if we were doing an audit at Marble Valley, we would we would bring in the PREA coordinator from St. Johnsbury to go do the audit at my no but, but we wouldn't we don't bring in the Yeah. That's a good okay. point. Or we okay. haven't, I should say. Yeah. We won't, but we have not. Thank you for that. Linda? Thank you. Um so okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so on the internal audits, which I think is a good idea. Um do they do a report, at least, to report back to you what they found? Um, yes. And who does it go to? I felt that coming. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I have that yes. question to make. The, so our PREA director would organize practice audits with the facilities. And it may be um, literally just a one-page Pay attention to these areas, but I would like have a to find it. Yeah, but I don't know if we have like a form or something standardized. No, that's okay. okay. But, but I'm saying it's it's not a practice audit. It's actually like an internal audit. Like you, but does it happen only when you're getting ready for the audit, or does it happen at different points in time? Oh, that's a good question. So we're always getting ready for an audit because we pretty much. We do two, uh, two a year during an audit cycle. Um, but no, they don't happen just before an audit. One, we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have time if we were trying to do like an all-nighter before the term paper kind of thing. But the, the, um, the idea is that um, audit should not be a scramble. I think they were, the first round, I would say they were a lot of pressure because we hadn't experienced that kind of audit. But by the time um, this next round comes, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a scramble. So I'm the pre coordinator. I come in and I do my internal audit to, and then I give you a memo on the findings. Yeah. Who am I handing that memo to and who will then act upon it? The superintendent gets it, the facilities exec gets it. I believe the deputy commissioner and the commissioner get it, but I'd have to check uh, whether that goes out at the same time or whether it goes to facilities exec and super, and then up the Who's chain. Who's the facility exec? 
Uh, right now it's Al Cormier. Okay, it's the person who oversees the, the facilities. The, the facilities. And that's, yeah. okay. And then how do they act upon it? Or is, do we know if they act upon it? I, I know they do. How do you know? Because we passed. But no, but no, no, I we're talking know. about the findings. We're talking about the internal memo that says A, B, and C. So how do you know that those are active? I, I can't, I couldn't tell you, but I think... Could that, you find out? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, so, oh, I could, I, I could yeah. actually answer that, if that would be helpful right oh, now. Sure. So um, on the PREA Resource Center, all of the audit materials are available. So we actually have, there's a few different documents that the auditors use, including literally the entire audit form. But this so, is the internal audit. Right, but the mock okay. audit is based off the audit. So for the simple reason that we're going through and making sure that we're meeting those standards. So for example, we might do an audit on uh, document tracking. Are we keeping all the paperwork that we're supposed to be doing? So we're literally following what's on that audit tool and then indicating on the audit tool where we didn't meet the standard. And where is that post? The internal memo. that go, That would go to me as the PREA director, because uh, and the, as well as the facilities exec and... And so you um, get that, and then what do you do? Uh, I would save it, uh, and then I would review with the superintendent or the PREA review coordinator. Review with the superintendent. Yep, okay. or the PREA coordinator as far as depending on what the issue is and how we would be addressing those issues. And then if they are addressed, <clears throat> or they're not addressed, what's the step before the actual audit happens? I think that, that's a good question. So I would so I, I would say I don't think we have a directive process for that. Okay. That's because I think that might be what you're getting at. I don't mm -hmm. know that that protocol is in directive practicing for an audit. And then um, the PREA office is a resource office, right? So if I'm the PREA director, I'm going to report what I need to report up the chain, and I, don't, I may not necessarily, I might not know uh, what the conversation is between the facilities exec and the superintendent, but I will probably know that something's been um, fixed, or maybe they need more coaching, or they might need some help on it. So um, the that loop back might not necessarily happen unless they needed some help. Okay, thank you. I'm going to interrupt a moment for Felicia. So, you're the pre office. That's so the pre office rate one. <laughs> one of you. Yeah, the pre office. So, if there's a, a concern or a complaint or something comes up that staff at a facility feels was for, you know, they went to the pre office with a concern then it's incumbent on the PREA office to report that to either the facility court exec mm -hmm. or the superintendent of that facility or whatever. How, if it's resolved, or there's a process to be resolved, number one, do you, does the office know the process that's going to be put in place to resolve it? Are we talking about complaints or audits? Complaints. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Does the PREA office know how it's going to be resolved? Not necessarily. So, does the person that filed the complaint, it could be a correctional officer or something within a facility, does that correctional officer or the person who filed the complaint to the PREA office know how it was resolved? When you say a complaint, I'm not. What do you mean by a complaint? An allegation? An allegation. An, so the, the PREA standards actually um, require that the person gets notified. Um, a person who either the makes person a report, who made, who made a report or the victim. And who would notify that person? Is it the PREA office or is it the facility exec superintendent that resolved it? Um, it would be the site <coughs> PREA coordinator or myself. <coughs> So you would get word back from the superintendent and the exec of the facility how they would proceed to resolve. So the local PREA coordinators are responsible for all of the incidents that are sexual victimization in nature. So they have a process per the directive that they follow. Part of that process is that the reporter and or victim is notified of the conclusion. So the facility 
determines the conclusion of the incident, and then there's a, a form that we have that is given to the reporter or the uh, victim. Are there times where the staff that <coughs> reported an allegation where there were no actions taken and they just, staff felt that there was no action, just came to a stop? Staff reporting an allegation of inmate on inmate? Inmate on inmate or staff on inmate or something. And they felt that no action was taken. Mm -hmm. I'm sure yes. Um, because they are investigations and um, I mean I, you know that's the, I don't know where to start with that one but the question is does staff feel like um, there are times where people aren't following up yes I believe that's the answer to that is yes okay Felicia great um, are these mock audits public records not where they exempt the statute. I don't know. I, I, I don't I'm know. sorry, I didn't hear your question. If I were to fill out a public records request to the PREA office saying I would like a copy of all of the mock audits you've done. Is that subject to the Public Records Act? Yeah, and if not, where in statute are they specifically exempt? I, I, they could be privileged. I don't know. They, I, okay. I'm never not going to know the answer to where any science that starts is where in statute is it. <laughs> right. Well, she's not at that level of working with statute. But the question is, are those mock audits, audits subject to the public records law? And we don't have an answer to that. I would. And if they're exempt, why are they exempt? Is a privileged information, and therefore know. they're exempt. Okay, because I would presume that names could be taken out very easily, um, but that that could be really helpful. Well, that's how the public records law is written. It's very complicated. Yes, we went through that here for inmate files. <laughs> and sometimes they're privileged and confidential. So you'd have to talk to the public records legal staff that we have here in Ledge Council to have them do some work. It's not Helena, it's whoever no, they place. No, it's, uh, it's Tucker Anderson. Tucker Anderson. Well, you know, I'm sure press will start working on this. <laughs> right, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Just, just checking. Just checking. <laughs> probably already have filed one, you know, and that has to work through the process when you have a public records request. It has to work through the process. If well, it works. Mm -hmm. Isn't it 72 hours with a possible extension of 10 days? Just never know. You never know. You never know. Okay. I forgot where I was. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Report, uh, let me see. Retaliation. We finished. Uh, so, Jen just covered reporting to inmates. If, they're, if they um, have reported something, we need to get back to them. We've received <clears> this, and um, uh, we have to make sure that all the written forms are completed. Um, in some cases, uh, the victims weren't notified that we received the complaint and were pursuing it. And uh, I think in some cases, folks refused to sign the form. And that there's a variety of reasons for that, and that happens sometimes. So the, those are in, that's inmates, mm -hmm. not staff. Right. Okay. Um, so what would be some of the reasons why an inmate re would refuse to sign a form? Um, Just plain honorary. Yeah. Sometimes, no, yeah, uh -huh. sometimes, um, bad day, and we need to ask again on another day. Um, maybe mental health issues, maybe a particular beef in another area, maybe they're afraid. <laughs> Am I missing any? They don't agree with the outcome. Ah, that's mm -hmm. an obvious one, yes. The same if they don't agree with the outcome, and they don't sign the form, 
What is the recourse then for the inmate if they don't agree for the outcome? There's no recourse. If I'm understand, recourse is like a consequence, right? No, no. Do. Where, where would well, they oh, appeal? What can they do? Yeah. Um, and they could use a grievance. Uh, they could write to a superintendent. They could contact an attorney, prisoners' rights. Um, I mean, they can pursue it any way they wish. Those are we missed the very last one. Oh, I thought that was sexual abuse incident oh. reviews. Um, that if I rec that was updating the procedure. Is that right? Do we have to we had to update the form? So um, these incident reviews need to happen with uh, within thirty days and. Um, that's with, uh, is this, this is the SRT, SR team, okay. Um, and that is the superintendent, health services, I'm looking at Jen, the, uh, who else is on that review team? Security, management, mental health, medical, uh, case management, program staff, um, and if there's any other party that would need to be. And they need to be, uh, those meetings need to happen regularly. Um, they would be discussing uh, um, all things, including uh, retaliation, monitoring, and we needed to show uh, documentation that that was happening. And we did. I think in most cases, if I recall, it was that they were happening, but not within 30 days. It was outside of 30 days. So these are all the areas in the audits, the last audits that we that were done at all the facilities. Mm -hmm. And these are areas where there needed to be some remediation. And this is how they were, you laid out how it was remediated. Was some of this more in one of our facilities or two of our facilities, or was it pretty broad across all facilities? Is there anything that really rises to the surface here? Um, this is pretty broad across the facility, all of them. Um, we discussed the areas where it might be a little more complicated to solve, like Chittenden, that those issues are going to be a little more complicated. For the most part, um, we if we uh, met a standard, most of the facilities met the standard, so it might be the standard around um, documentation with regards to reporting, or a standard um, um, in, within health services or uh, training, for example, is one area where we, I think we had roughly four or five standards where we exceeded, we exceeded expectations and training was one of them. Um, the investigation process was another one in terms of making sure that there was follow through. But this general theme was basically <laughs> the same. So if we need to update a form for screening, we need to update a form for screening across the board. None of these really had one facility that jumped out in a specific area. So how does PREA play across the spectrum? How does it play across the, the supervisory personnel? A, maybe you're going to get to that in culture. But, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the correctional officers and, and the inmates. Uh, is there... Um. I mean, one would hope that the superintendents would buy into it quickly, but maybe they don't. What? So, yes, <clears throat> one would hope that. So, and I, the superintendents buy into it now, and they have for some time. Um, but again, we started, I think I attended my first staff sexual misconduct training. It was in D.C. Um, at American University in, I think, 1999 or two, 2000. That was the beginning of the conversation. This was pre-standards. And this, um, this work was coming out of um, advocacy groups, and in this particular case was hosted by Washington College of Law with one of the uh, Prison Rape Commission members, Brenda Smith, who was um, really just, a, she was a pioneer in terms of um, safety and sexual safety for women offenders and expanded her work into staff sexual misconduct and the concept that uh, this is a security risk. So how that connects up to your question, Butch, which is how does it play out in terms of, you're talking about like the everyday um, 
everyday work life of a supervisor mm -hmm. and a CEO. So it begins really with uh, making sure that we um, attach the training needs of our incoming employees, uh, not just to the standards, but to the buy-in that everyone has the right to be safe, including, including our staff. And the skills required to complete, um, to, to lift up the mission of the Prius standards have to do with communication, escalation, observation skills, um, not to mention we really need to develop that muscle around uh, personal and professional resiliency. As Commissioner Baker said earlier, this is not an easy job and we have to pay attention to employee wellness and health and conditions in the workplace. All that said, we know culturally how it impacts staff. Um, it can become a vicious cycle. For example, if you have a facility that isn't staffed properly, then you're gonna have more people um, doing more overtime. And if you have more overtime, you're gonna have more um, people getting sick, which means your sick days go up. And when your sick days go up, you're even shyer on staff, and so um, your burnout increases, and you're at risk of an uptick in things like um, incidents or mistakes or even being um, short-tempered, right? So it, ch it changes, really, the environment of the whole facility. And so, um, that plays into all of our efforts, whether it's recruitment and retention or support from leadership. There isn't an area that PREA doesn't touch. And the um, if you go to any PREA training across the country for corrections, what you're gonna hear, first of all, if you are in corrections and you haven't heard of PREA, <laughs> there's a very big problem. The point about PREA and the standards and the cultural attachment is this. If you are committed to PREA, you are committed to corrections best practices. If you are making sure that your cameras in, are in place, your cameras are in place not just for sexual safety, but for the safety of staff and the, the safety of volunteers and contractors and inmates. Cameras work for every area. If you are training, if we're training our staff um, how to look for evidence of some kind of abuse, then we're going to be able to um, have trained staff that can see uh, symptoms of coercion and strong arming. If we understand how pervasive the code of silence can be and how that can interrupt be the outcomes of PREA, then that's going to address the code of silence in all areas so that we don't have a corrections culture that is based on secrecy. And if it's working in the PREA world, it should be working in the security world, it should be working for volunteers, it should be working for visitors, it should be working in health services and across the board. That's the idea. It's a heavy lift and there's a lot of skills. One of the most important skills for our officers and supervisors has to do with our advanced communication techniques. In our department, it's 40 hours and you cannot graduate the academy if you don't pass what we call ACT training advanced communication techniques. What we do with this training is that we train our officers to put language to every behavior and it runs off a scale. The lowest behavior in our department is, is what we would call agitated. And the highest behavior in terms of security would be threat of lethal. And from agitated, it goes from agitated, disruptive, destructive, and dangerous. And we literally break down each behavior, so not so, that we can speculate on what someone's feelings, but so we don't speculate on what someone's feeling. So the behavior agitated, we might see that an offender who usually talks a lot is now not talking. Mm -hmm. And that's not, we're not gonna put into a report, we're concerned, and this is dangerous, we're gonna put into a report, inmate so-and-so, inmate Smith, was agitated as evidenced by, he's usually talking all the time, but he's been sitting in his cell for three hours not saying anything. Does this mean that he has been sexually <coughs> abused? Not necessarily, but it means we need to ask a question. That's the premise of how we move this culture in terms of making sure that we're not being presumptuous and that we're not ignoring subtle signs 
and we're not putting our feeling language on a language that should be evidence language. Dis the next level up from agitated is disruptive, and that's when you see somebody who's doing something they normally wouldn't do, but it's impacting others. So um, generally, um, Jen behaves herself in the unit, but that day she's being loud and interrupting people who are trying to watch the TV or standing in front of the TV in the day room. Once you are impacting other people, the word we use is disruptive. The reason this is important is because the, our staff are going to understand from there what their specific intervention is going to be because we train them that as well. And they will be able to explain it in a report. And so it doesn't matter whether you're a CO, one, or a shift supervisor, or a commissioner, if you see the word agitated in a report, you're going to know this is low level, not, 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 not important, but lower level behavior, and then you'll have an understanding of what it was. The point for, from our perspective is that if we catch things early on, then we are addressing the preventive portion of the PREA standards. That's the first outcome of the standards and the audits and the mission is that we are as preventive as possible. And um, really the numbers don't matter. We want our number, we, you know, it's prison rape elimination, we know that's the goal. We also understand that it's not going to completely go away. And we understand that it, the, the fear of as in, is as impactful as nothing happening. So if you're serving your sentence and you're constantly terrified of this happening, <coughs> that can be as damaging as anything. And so we need to be looking for the signs. How it affects the culture in terms of supervision is that we have to, we've got to build um, more of a coaching environment. So if we're all training the same thing and the supervisors are supervising to this, that's going to lend itself to um, a culture where we're saying the same thing and we can intervene at the same place. As you go up the scale, the stakes get higher, and we know that once we get to uh, dist um, destructive behavior, we're looking at things like gross motor activity and raising your voice, and we know that once somebody starts yelling or maybe um, moving their arms um, in a way that's wider and faster, that the likelihood that something's going to happen that's physical is pretty imminent. Usually within, I think we say, zero to 60 once you get to that point. So the idea is that we're constantly de-escalating. And so we train specific modules. There's um, giving clear directions is one module. We train how to give a clear direction and to assess for cooperation right away. I really want to keep going, but I. It sounds like being a parent. Well, a good parent, That's right? I wish I'd use some of these things. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the idea is that if someone has something to say, that it is our responsibility to kind of listen it out before we jump to conclusions. And the modules are really t that we start at the lowest level to test for cooperation because if something's hard to say, we need to be listening more often. So we literally train listening as a skill. Um, we train uh, how to assess for cooperation, and it's real low-level stuff, but I, mean, I think we've all had a boss where you go to the office and you want to ask for time off, and he or she doesn't even look up from the computer, I'm coming back later. We ask them to um, really look at things like body language and change in behavior. The idea there, too, is that we're trying to prevent other work and extra work. There's an officer at Chittenden, we have a great deal of respect for him. He's been there for a while. His name's Godwin Nyaho. And he says, um, you're going to spend 20 minutes. Do you want to spend it talking and listening and find out what the issue is? Or do you want to spend the 20 minutes getting your uh, uniform all wrinkled and getting sweaty? You're going to spend the 20 minutes. Spend it wisely is his point, which is that when we go to get cooperation, we need to do it from a place where the person who goes to do the thing we've asked them to do is because they believe that that's the right thing to do at that time. So if it's to lock in or to mop the floor or to go back to class, we want to come from a place where we're giving them choices. Is that always going to happen? Absolutely not. But the intention of um, 
the Priya work is that when we have, when we cultivate that kind of culture, then everybody is cooperating. And for when we st first started training this a long time, I'm going back almost 20 years when we first started to deliver this, our staff said to us, if you give us all the same words to use, and all the same verbal templates to use when we, when we talk to the offenders, they're gonna know what we're gonna say. And we said, exactly. Exactly, so if they know, when you say please lock in, and they say I don't want to, and you say please lock in, they know after the third please lock in, we're gonna say, listen, you got a choice. You can lock in, or you can have us walk you in. You choose. Knowing that that language is coming, is supposed, you know, the idea is that we are empowering people to make the choice that they wanna make, and it's not always the best one, but they have <laughs> We were, we were a good eight years into this before we started to incorporate sexualized work environment behavior, and that's not easy. So when we added to the continuum, what we knew is that when it came to, uh, and both genders are equally challenging, but the women were challenging. We had transitioned three facilities at this time, and we were getting very clear picture, mostly from male officers, but not all male officers, that it's very stressful. I heard many times during those years from in training environments that officers would prefer perhaps to be in a use of force than to work in a women's unit. But we, because we train for use of force. We train over and over and over again. And we train to work with the um, adrenaline and the amygdala response. And anyone who's done use of force training understands that you have to practice, and you practice over and over again, because when the moment comes, you can't be worried about where you're, you know, where does the wrist go, and where are my handcuffs. We work off muscle memory. And what we discovered during this time is that we needed to operate off the same amygdala response and muscle memory when it came to speaking up and showing their most courageous leadership because some situations are extraordinarily awkward. And so we talk about things like cross-gender searches, and we talk about, you know, if my, my day job is to literally figure out how much I'm supposed to look at someone bathrooming, that's a different kind of career. And not only do we have to do that, but we have to figure out how we're gonna discuss it and discuss the challenges. And the women were challenging and are challenging because we're different. We <laughs> and the feedback that we got was that the women just did not take no for an answer. So, and again, I'm generalizing and I'm sharing with you the conversation, not just in Vermont, but nationally, is that um, the, the word was manipulative, that we were manipulative and that we didn't take no for an answer. And the so MO, who was manipulative, the officers or the women, women, the women inmates? Well, I heard comments over my career that women in general were manipulative, but in this particular discussion, it was about the MA population. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this had to do with skills again. It was about how we were listening and how we were training. And it's a challenge to connect our expectations about keeping a facility safe, about addressing behavior, but also these are good people who came in with, you know, with upbringings where we were chivalrous and we were respectful. And so when a female walks into a day room and doesn't have a bra on, we have to tell her, please go put a bra on. Well, if I'm raised to not look at your breasts and I understand that the rules are different in the workplace and I'm not really programmed that way, I might not look at you. So now I'm not making eye contact while I have to give you direction and this is a confusing message. And so the it became, what is, what is it exactly that we're going to say? What exactly do we say? Go put a bra on? That's, we had a lot of that. And then there was argument. You didn't ask Jane to put one on yesterday, and you didn't ask Kathy on Wednesday. <laughs> and that's not fair. Again, generally speaking, the feedback we got when you, when there was direction to a male inmate. They were either going to do it or they weren't.
but there wasn't going to be a long discussion about it. <laughs> and this is a different dynamic for our department, and this was a real challenge. It came down to basic things, like using this behavior continuum. We literally train Officer so-and-so to say, Ms. Sprafke, you're not wearing a bra. Go back to your cell and put a bra on. And she's going to argue with me. And, I'm gonna, and she's going to say, you're looking at me. You shouldn't be looking at my breasts, because that's where it usually ends up. You're looking at me. It's my job to watch you go put a bra on. It's as simple as that. But it wasn't that simple, because we hadn't empowered our staff to say, it's my job to watch you. And believe me, there is a difference between watching, looking, leering, staring, glaring, ogling. And we have hashed it out and talked it out. And when you put it on paper, it's very hard to prove. Officer so-and-so was leering at me. How do you write that? So it comes down to a feeling. Keep going. No. <laughs> it's, this is really good. It really is. It's understanding the culture. It's understanding the culture. And I think that's what's really hard for folks to understand unless they are live it and are in it like you folks are. Or it's a standing committee in the legislature that looks at a lot of corrections policy and all the nuances of all the statuses of corrections and all the layers that happen within a facility and their directives and then your rules, administrative rules, all of that. Legislators that look at that on a daily basis have a concept of what it is. And then outside of that, it's a foreign environment for folks. and. I think people come to the conclusion based in terms of what they know within their own family structure and their work structure, whatever that may be. And it's not a correction structure. Right. And so they bring that concept to the world of corrections, and that's not apples to apples. It's, a, it's an adjustment. And it's an need. ugly adjustment at times, too. Mm -hmm. And we need to we need to support. It's an adjustment for everyone. It's an adjustment if you live there, and it's an adjustment if you visit, and an adjustment if you if you work there. And um, it really does come. There's a there's an enormous amount of content under this particular slide, formal and informal and default. The formal really is what is your rules? What's on paper? What are your policies? What's the statute? And in the corrections world. How we train this is we basically, you know, we can take any area. What do we know is formal? What kind of ceremonies do we have? What do we wear? We wear uniforms. And if the uniforms um, are put together and they're pressed and um, everyone's looking like they're squared <coughs> away, then we know that we are meeting the uniform standard. If you're looking at someone and it's your uniform is all wrinkled and maybe there's a little bedhead happening, we got to ask the question. That's an informal question. Like, if people aren't coming in ready to work, what What's does that look on? like? If the if chain of command, we say the chain of command is in a formal section of corrections culture, and we know who the boss is, but if you walk into a facility. <coughs> You got to ask the question: Who's really running the show? And if it's not the boss, we are now in the area of what we call informal culture. Informal is where the pre work is um, makes or breaks us. It is the informal culture where nothing is written down, but it's the language that we speak. And it's been the informal culture that has perpetuated the thinking that prison rape can and should be part of a sentence. That is not in writing. That is not the law. And that is at the heart of what we're trying to tackle, whether it's through um, recruitment and retention efforts or training efforts or the behavior scale that I described. If we don't stay on top of that component, we fall to the default culture. And the, fall, the default culture you can measure by looking at sick days, investigations, morale, attrition, retention rates, all kinds of things that um, can cycle out and make things 
even harder. For us, we're just very grateful that you're willing to hear what this looks like, to um, listen to some of what the challenges have been, and even consider um, discussions around keeping, keeping this work moving. I think we're all a little worn out. <laughs> This has been very good testimony, very good discussion. We have a lot more work to do with you folks, um, and also as a committee. I don't have anything else to offer. I don't know if anyone else does. I don't want you to. <laughs> I, I, I really, corrections is a world, you know, it's very similar in some ways to our education field where people say that well it's easy to be a teacher <laughs> it's terrific it's easy to be work <laughs> it's terrific meaningful work it is work. but you know the public thinks it's really easy being a teacher and yeah. they're making a lot of money so if that's the case then go in and do that job yeah and i think people are feeling well corrections is pretty simple i mean all you got is people there who are going to be taking up a cell and that's all you've got to deal with yeah, yeah, not it's, so. It's not so. <laughs> it's, a human, it's a human condition. Um, we are hiring. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we know. Um, anything else? Thank you. We're going to have you yeah. folks back right around during the week. And you, you said you would work with Phil. Thank God we got Phil. <laughs> um, with some different topics that you'd yeah. be working at within PREA. Have, have you... Um, that was our, my question um, after this, um, <laughs> enough with the culture, and here's, here's the opportunity here because we don't know when you'll be sick of us, <laughs> that the reporting and investigating is big, um, the hotline is big, uh, mm -hmm. LGBTQ care and custody is big. Uh, training efforts around uh, sexualized work environments, staff sexual misconduct. So I want to be respectful of the fact that we can't be in here all the time. So why don't you write those down? And choose, you can choose. And give that to Phil. Okay. And then when we do scheduling, Phil, Butch, and I can sort of prioritize that and see. Okay. Um, you are scheduled. I believe you are scheduled back. Yeah, yeah. On, Thursday. on Thursday. Mm -hmm. This is for training and professional development. Peace. So that we can check off on your list. But if you wrote down all those items, those specific items, and gave them to Phil before tomorrow, before tomorrow at 12. Thursday, right? Or no? Well, we are scheduled Thursday at 10.15 on reporting and investigating. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we don't have any other subject areas. Okay. But not so tomorrow? It, <coughs> not tomorrow. Okay. No. So on Thursday. But if you could write out all those items you just mentioned and have that done and to fill by tomorrow at 12. No. Then we can, we'll do scheduling after that for the next for next week. Okay. Now our time next week may be more limited in terms of what we we spend with DOC because the governor will be giving his budget address on Tuesday. Okay. So once that occurs, we will be getting our bu budget adjustment for our capital bill. Okay. So we'll be doing our other work, which deals with budgeting of state infrastructure needs along with corrections policy. Okay. So the day, our days will be split between those two items. And we will attempt to do DOC work in the afternoon. Doesn't mean it's gonna work out that way. But that will be our attempt. Sometimes if we're busy on the floor in the afternoon, we might have to juggle that. Okay, we'll be flexible. And we'll have a list to you by tonight. I feel much more comfortable after giving that overview mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. suggestions if you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will work with you. Okay. Don't worry. Okay. Kurt, you had something? A uh, quick question that may not have anything to do with any of this, but what is epic? Epic training? Oh, ethics? 
That's a risk assessment tool that we use. Oh, okay. And That's you do not want me to. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good. It does not. That's all I want. Yeah, that was Anything else? That was an easy one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.